Hello, and welcome to the Kumba Kickback. This is our first of first panel of the day. We have uh, pan uh, three panels today and three tomorrow. Yep. Um, and I want to thank everyone on this lovely panel full of amazing women um, for joining us. So let's just go around. Um, let's start with Eliana, if you can introduce yourself. Tell us your Hogwarts house if you're into that sort of thing and what you do and who you are. <laughs> Hello, my name is Eliana Amira. My Hogwarts house is Ravenclaw. I want to call it the best house, but I know that there's some non-Ravenclaws in the in the con. But at the same house cry, right? Every house is the best house for the people that are in it. Absolutely. There you go. So sure. <laughs> best house, Ravenclaw. Um <laughs> I am what was what else? Who you are and what you do. What do you do? I'm a director. I'm a writer, director, producer, but primarily a director. Um, I'm very enmeshed in the in the Harry Potter space because I created a web series called Hermione Granger and the Quarter Life Crisis. And that has been a really incredible experience. And it just continues to be an incredible experience. Um, and, and I'm a fan turned creator, like literally. And there we go. And that's it. That's me. Yes, uh, Connie. Hi, uh, I'm Connie, obviously. Uh, managing creative of Black Girls Create. I write for a children's magazine. Um, what children's <laughs> magazine, Connie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Time for Kids, you know, Time Magazine's classroom edition for students. Um, so no big deal, yeah. Yeah, it's fine, it's cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yeah, I create those things and then I write fan fiction sometimes. So, you know. She's also the managing creative. editor of Black I Girls said Create. That first. I started off with it in her defense. Okay. Well, I just got like, you know. Okay. Thank you, Eliana. I'm sorry, she edits our Critical fight. Companion series. She yeah. out here. And she's also Twitter famous I and know. be interviewing doctors on main stages at major cons. It's fine. Hey. It's fine. Angelique's next, so. <laughs> 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 I have True. Nothing, doesn't bother me this time because Angelique <laughs> is on this call. <laughs> um, what? I don't know what you're um, Angelique, about. would you like to tell us who you are if you're uh -huh. Hogwarts house, if you go there and um, what you do, which we all know what you do because we have eyes, but you know what I mean? What you do, what you be doing? I mean, I'd be sitting here trying to be Freddie Brooks. That's kind of my, my life goal is just to emulate Cree Summer. You know, she just hit her 400th character, guys. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yes, what? Um, I'm Angelique Rocher. I'm a retired lawyer, uh, technically. Uh, yeah, at my Hogwarts house, you know, I go back and forth, uh, go Gryffindor, but also like I got a little Hufflepuff in me. It's a thing. I just basically, I just run into danger and then mm. feel bad for the people that I beat because I empathetic. <laughs> See, that gives me Slytherin Hufflepuff vibes. So. Mm. You're super ambitious. I've met you, girl. Yeah, you're you definitely. <laughs> I mean, I was gonna say, like, I the fact that Slytherin hasn't come up is like crazy to me, but Ever. I'm gonna let you cook. I'm and no, I have taken the test and I've never gotten Slytherin. So clearly, my subconscious is lying. Yeah. Clearly my you just be out here. Which is like, Slytherin, whatever. Um, I, I feel like Slytherin's in there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, because I've met you and you've um, Slytherin like yelled at me like about being ambitious and stuff, because, you know, Hufflepuff, and you're like, Connie, do this, 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 and this, and then... I was more like, Connie, you're a badass. Like, why do you know? No, you're a badass. All of these things are true. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I uh, I am now a creative. I have a couple of podcasts with a couple of places. Um, those uh, places being? Uh, I have a show called Marvel's Voices, uh, as well as I have a show called Geeks Plan at Sci-Fi Wire. And they say that I am a senior contributing correspondent at Sci-Fi Wire, oh, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> I talk about nerdy things and it's pretty great. Uh, and then I do communications consulting for um, different organizations that I feel uh, very passionate about, the Ms. Foundation, the Religious Institute here in New York, because <laughs> rent is high in New York and digital <laughs> media is not gonna pay it. <laughs> Coming to another place where the rent is high, but also <laughs> doing digital media things, Dara. <laughs> Love we, that. We all out here. By the way, we're all out here in cities in which the rent 
is it's high. It's high. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I am, oh, hello. I am Dara M. Wilson. Um, <clears throat> my rent is too high in the Bay Area. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little rough out here. Um, I am a Slytherin. Um, which Robin knows when I got that the first she time, so I did mad. literally cry. Um, like, why are we so mad about being Slytherin? I don't know because like, she like, said it, and I was like, <laughs> Yeah, you are. She was like, But I'm not a bad person. I was like, No, <laughs> that's, that's not what it is. That is. I, to be fair to me, I think. At that point, I had only read the first book like yeah. 15 years before that or something. I hadn't gone through the whole series. I still don't feel great about it, but it's fine. I don't feel great about it because it's true. That's what that <laughs> is. That's reality knocking on your door. Um, I ha- I do stand-up comedy in the Bay in other places. Um, I have a podcast uh, called Money Ha Ha, which is about money, but it is funny, I promise. Um, and to pay my rent, I lead consumer marketing at a financial well-being app here in Oakland. That's work. That's you. That's a lot. I'm Robin. <laughs> I'm a Ravenclaw. I am a co-founder of Black Girls Create. I co-host Wizard Team and um, who watch Time and of Blackness and. Space. Oh yeah, I forgot and that one. I forgot that one. I do that too. You, you, yeah, I knew there was something you forgot, but you know, I also have ADD, so I can't remember what I said after I said it, and <laughs> or while I'm saying it. Um, and I also run the community at Black Girls Create. So um, stay tuned again, for our community panel after this one. Right, we will talk about community in the next panel. But you know, also join our community on Twitter on Slack. Um, however you feel comfortable and you will see me there <laughs> managing or trying to. So let's say all that to say, um, the title and the point of this panel is be and a creator. And we're gonna be talking about how participating in fandom can often spark your own creative voice, your own creative juices and um, how that, um, that, push and pull between those two things of creating new work, creating original things, and also creating uh, work that spawns off of current properties and things, how that works in your life. And, you know, just have a full on conversation. Um, If you are in the live stream, you can leave comments and we will see them. Or I think think I'll see them all. Um, And- uh, Already commenting. Amani's commenting, but we're just going to ignore that because <laughs> I think all of us on this panel have at some point had co- had Amani Heron in our mentions <laughs> yelling at us about something. <laughs> so <laughs> if you have questions, <laughs> um, Amani, if you have questions, uh, you can leave a comment and I will try to get to them. Okay. So going around for <clears throat> comfort serve, just jump in. What are some of the fandoms that you are a part of? Um, Harry Potter, for me, for sure. Um, other people. Dara has my favorite television. I want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, but just let us know, like, what are some fandoms that you consider yourself a part of? I would definitely say Doctor Who, uh, mm-hmm. Red Dwarf, any kind of British sitcom that started before 1992 uh, is a big fandom of my. Hey, it's it's a very nuanced. For CGI guys, the real <laughs> bad digital. Um, big, huge fandoms of mine, uh, as well as all the Resident Evil movies. At me, don't care what you feel about it. Own all of them, including all the Fast and Furious movies as well. At me, own all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I like bad movies as well. Uh, real bad movies, own all of the Twilights. <clears throat> Vampires shouldn't glitter but I do own them as well as anything that involves a zombie. Nice. I honestly didn't, I got, I love bad movies. I didn't get the Fast and the Furious thing until that latest trailer dropped and the dude caught the car. And then I was like, mm-hmm. okay, I might have to, I might have to go mm-hmm. there. Like I knew what was going on. I would never, I would never like belittle anyone for loving Fast and Furious. But I was just like, I don't get it. Like I saw the first one. I might've seen the, the Tokyo one. But I was just like, 
Not you for me. And then really I saw the trailer the and he caught the car. And I was like, did he disintegrate? <laughs> I don't want to jump my turn. Um, but if you've only seen Tokyo Drift in the first one, you have not really seen a Fast and the Furious <laughs> movie. Thank you. So if you movies. haven't seen a Fast and Furious with Tego Caldron and Don Armar in it, then you have not seen a Fast and Furious movie. <laughs> you I just not seen Fast and the Furious is at all rooted in reality. It's not a Fast and Furious movie. <laughs> ah, okay. What you saw was a prequel. It was something else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm, yeah, I just said that to say like, I didn't get it until this last trailer dropped, and I was like, "Oh, I get it." <laughs> Good story, though. Tokyo Drift was that movie that they were that that he was like, Vin was like, "I I don't know if I want to do this anymore yet," and then it actually did okay, and he was like, "Oh, we could do better," and then suddenly we've got nineteen of them. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. No, I think I think I saw up to the one the first one Tyrese did. That would be the, the, the second first one. one. Oh, was he the no, first? One? It's the second. That's yeah. the, Tyrese was like that friend that you were like, you got this guy out of jail to go get this friend. This <laughs> yeah. friend go get okay, sure. I think like I was definitely I was there when it first started. I don't know. I I have to say I've been very surprised over the years to see like how strong the fast and I, I I just didn't expect it. I was like, wow, this is like a real thing. It's like people being a fan over a Pitch Black series. Like Pitch Black wasn't great, but I own all of them too. I'm telling you, it's just, I, I was just you know how like you know you, these movies come and go. But I was like, damn, this thing is going strong. Like 18, 20 years later, and I was like, wow, this is really incredible. It's up there with Avatar, except no James Cameron. <laughs> oh, that Avatar! I was like, how not dare not at last the movie. Movie. I'm okay. talking about the Avatar <laughs> that already has four sequels that haven't been filmed yet. <laughs> yes. Okay, other mm -hmm. fandoms, anyone? So, uh, I feel like I like a lot of stuff, but I don't know that I'm in fandoms, right? You have to sort of be like active on Twitter. What counts? Um, I don't I know. know. I mean, it depends on like K dramas are one when, of them. Eliana, you are a major, major, um, influential member of the NSYNC fandom. So ah. that. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Influential, I think, controversial, but you're there. <laughs> I am heavy in the NSYNC fandom. Actually, I don't know if you guys saw this, but Lance Bass just, it was announced that he's doing an NSYNC fan movie. Um, I know, I know. Wait, I'm so, I didn't think this was, so wait, we get to count music as fandoms? Like, uh, no, 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 no. Like, so it's back to it's your like a fandom? I feel like you have to really be like- You gotta go, like, in sync, you gotta go, but like I was like very heavily into on the internet trading live recordings of like I I had at the oh, height of in sync like I would have like here we go from the German concert in like nineteen like like you you know yeah. what I mean you take it it's not just buying the albums it's like yeah it's not just buying the albums and like a, okay. it's kind of buff. okay it's like buying Prince bootlegs. Yes, but okay. I'm sharing. Okay. Cool. Well, you have to think about what are the elements of fandom, right? Like we wrote, me and my friends had like an instinct fanfic exchange. Yep. We write stories for each other. I have a virtual marriage license with JC Chazé. <laughs> I still think it's binding. I still think it's that I could get some tax cuts. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I just I never did the virtual marriage license. That that is a lot. I'm just saying. But only because I will be friends with them one day and I don't want to be like, oh my God. <laughs> so, so what I'm hearing is like elements of fandom, like writing fanfic, collecting obscure things, understanding some facts. So like fanfic of like Laurel K. Hamilton and Anita Blake when I was in high school technically is a fandom. Yes. That counts. That counts. That's okay. Right. Cool, because I did do, I did, yeah. I do feel like if there is a um, category on AO3 of it, it's a fandom. Oh, there you go. Cool. And I know, like, band fic is a thing, so I know NSYNC's on there. If you, if your Laurel Hamilton stuff's on, that, that's on there. Like, I feel like that's a good barometer of, like, if there's a fandom or not, because that I means that several disparate people decided to go do the same thing. That's yeah, it, I think to me, yeah. fandom is going above just, like, purchasing and consuming the work to, like, Talking about it online, making a community about it. You may you don't have to do because I didn't do a lot of fanfic. I knew the instinct fanfic existed, 
And I, that was my thing where I was like, well, I'm going to be friends with them one day. I just don't need, at my wedding, I don't need to explain to JC. You, you can't find a scrap of fanfic on the internet that I'm responsible for. Now, I read yeah. some really good stuff. Back in the day, we had the JJB, which was the Just Justin board. It was a message board. Uh, they were initially where you would go to get news of the NSYNC lawsuit. Um, yeah. I, yes. I, news. That was a time. Okay, no, news. no, no, no. You left our, our but that was a very stressful time in our lives. And we didn't know if they were going to be able to keep their no, name. Man. They're going to get broken no, up. Through it. See, this I, is how I know no. y'all aren't Prince fans. Because Prince yeah. literally sold his name, changed it, and then started recording more music. He was he like, oh, okay. No, he did that. But he was also Prince. Like, yeah. that's my whole life. They were and it like, was they literally like, like a Disney. Girl. It was tight and tense. Yeah. Yeah, they had no power, and we were like, Oh my god! But then, of course, you get no strings attached, and the rest is just history. History, <laughs> wow. amazing! Wow, I um, love this. This is fascinating. So, okay, so I'm I'm in the insane fandom, Harry Potter, obviously. I consider myself a part of, like I guess, I feel like I consume a lot of K dramas, and that's a world that, like, me and my I haven't written any fanfic or anything. I certainly have like considered how I can be involved, but I also don't speak the languages. So that's a barrier. And then I feel like the people that do are like weird, you know, these, these very intense yeah. um, people that are a lot like, you know what I'm saying? I do feel like the case. You're saying that the people who learn <laughs> Korean to further participate in the K-drama and K-pop fandom are kind of almost fetishizing a culture to an extent that makes you uncomfortable. And to be honest with you, because because K-love has become such a weird space, like I, that's also made me back off a little bit because I, I don't want to be a part of anything. That, I like genuinely like the work, right? And I've liked the work. It's my favorite television because I like the format of it. And I think the writers are like, there's a lot of people in the work that I really like, but I have like taken some steps back because it's like, eh, okay, you do have to be careful because it has become so fetishized. So that I'm like, I, I may not be a part of that fandom, but like if it was a healthy fandom, I'd totally be there. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. I'm not a lot of, I'm not a part, I'm not part of a lot of fandoms. I'm thinking the merch I have is all in sync. Harry Potter. I actually have a lot of Star Wars merch. <laughs> I mean, and that just, I need you all to know. I just need you all to know that Eliana, I don't know why she has all of the Star Wars merch when she just got, she got here. Listen, listen I'm not trying to gatekeep. I'm not gatekeeping anybody. It's just hilarious to me because she got she, here last year. She weekend. got here last year. I got here like, like no, no, no. No, first of all, it doesn't matter when you. No, get no, no, no. But, but, but this is Eliana. This is it's just the it's just a slight difference. I feel because she came in hot. Like I don't know about all this. And then I'm like, no. But did you watch it? And she was just like, I seen half of one and like half another one. And we're like, you no. Know, but did you watch it? And she was just like, just no. And then we're like, okay, let's sit down and have you watch them. And then she's just like, okay, fine. <laughs> it's just funny. <laughs> no, it's just funny. Yes, I'm not, I don't want to gatekeep anyone from any fandom. No, no, no. I'm glad she's here. I want to say it's my number one goal in life to never have a black woman say, I just think it's hilarious how. <laughs> like those, those proceed only devastating words and statements. <laughs> you have to be knocked out. No, um, not in place. It's, but it's okay. The thing is, though, she's right. I just think it's funny <laughs> how. <laughs> Did we have to clap for this, Cara? No, thank you. No. <laughs> All right, Dara, your fandoms, and then we're gonna move on because <laughs> we're okay. halfway through this panel. <laughs> <laughs> this is just us hanging. It's an excuse for us to hang out. It's cool. We can do this. Um, I am on the Fast and the Furious train. Fast and the Furious presents Hobbs and Shaw is one of the best movies I've ever seen. If it was, if it was okay in the movie theater, I would have jumped up and run around. It was. <laughs> But you know what makes no it way. the thing that made it great is because it was revenge. The whole movie was vengeance. Yes, <laughs> it was perfect. It was a perfect movie. Like it was terrible and bad and not good, but also yes. it was the perfect movie. It's the best movie I've ever seen in my life. Wow. Um, I, all, I I wouldn't say I'm in the Twilight fandom, but I did watch the first movie 
many times. I might still be watching. I'm probably a ghost who um, <laughs> died watching that Twilight movie. Um, Robin mentioned television. I do like television. I'm 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 better at watching television than anyone I know in my life. I consume <laughs> massive amounts of TV. Um, if there is a fandom for Frasier. Mm. I actually know someone who is a Frasier fandom and does Frasier fanfic and writes scripts. I'd love to introduce you to him. I He's would great. love to be introduced to that person. I'm in a few like Frasier uh, shit posting groups, but it's like kind of an excuse for people to be shitty. And sorry, can I curse? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good, cool, because I did twice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, it, they're, it, it's like a, they're, they're trying to make distance from it and be ironic about it, but they love the show because it's so specific. Uh, so there is that. And then I guess my my one true fandom is alt comedy. Um, oh my like, God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have nightmares about Marcel well. the show. Crab thing. What? What is it? Marcel the Shell? Yeah. Marcel the So whatever whatever you showed me. <laughs> that one and then the red, don't worry, I'm happy. Fine. That it's one. Called Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Those are different things. Um all, <laughs> <laughs> all great. That stuff that you should check out. Marcel Marcel the Shell with shoes on is Jenny Slate. Um, so that is like alt comedy-ish. Um and yeah, just like a whole bunch of weird podcasts that I, I have to recommend to people. And I'm like, just make sure you listen to 10 episodes before you decide if you like it or not, because it takes a little while to get into it. Um, but it is, I also have that kind of weird thing where in the back of my head, like when I first started listening to this stuff, I was like, I don't know how, because I, I wasn't even truly doing comedy yet. I definitely wasn't doing stand up. I was like, I don't know how, but I'm going to become friends with all these people. So it's really important for me to act the right way. And now I am kind of halfway in, like through the various podcasts and comedy things I've done. I have weaseled my way into friendships with a lot of these people. Um, so maybe I don't even like doing comedy. Maybe the only reason I'm doing it is to <laughs> like meet your, your faves. But I don't want to meet them as a fan. You know what I yeah. mean? Same. I want them to be like, oh, yeah, Dara's here. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, like man. SF Sketch Fest is a comedy festival that happens in San Francisco every January. And I went as a fan for so many years. And I got in. And half of me getting in was me being like, yeah, because I'm doing comedy. And that's validation. And half was, I'm going to go to the after party. <laughs> All of Tonkins is gonna be there, <laughs> and that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess like alt comedy slash UCB. Any anybody who's come out of UCB, I probably know. Mm. Nice. I like UCB. UCB is some good stuff. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I feel it's also like like people in UCB show up in a lot of your favorite TV shows. So it is a nightmare to like watch things like The Good Place with me. Cause I'm like, oh, that's that person. They were this oh, thing, they're also in this thing. <laughs> but like, also like, like Darcy Garden, product at UCB. Yeah. Like <laughs> you, you're just waiting for people to kind of hit so you can be like, yes, it is Darcy Carden. Let me tell you everything she's ever done. <laughs> she is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And also very tall. Very, very tall and beautiful and funny. I'm gonna stop. Sounds I'll just like Dara. Um, um, I'm sorry. I know that that I know, but it's true. But I, so I'm not. I'm not sorry, but I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. I personally am a Harry Potter fandom. I'm on this. I'm on the Star Trek fandom the way that Dara is on Frasier. Like there was a moment when we when I lived closer to Dara, and I felt like every time I would come over, she was watching Frasier. And I asked her one time, and I was like, do you just watch this on repeat? Like, do you take breaks? Do you, <laughs> or do you finish the series and then press play on the pilot again? <laughs> and that's where I'm at in Star Trek now. <laughs> where I'm like, I just finished. I, I just finished rewatching Voyager, and now I'm halfway through rewatching uh, Next Generation while also Picard mm -hmm. is on. So I'm just constantly consuming Star Trek, and you can do that. Like, I could literally only watch Star Trek and be fine and be watching a lot of television. <laughs> so um, wow. that's where I'm currently at. Voyager my... is the one that I have never watched. Voyager is the one that you've never watched? 
Well, oh, an enterprise. We don't like acknowledge enterprise. Yeah, no. By we, I mean the royal we. We don't. Yeah, we don't. no. I literally watched, in quotes, watched Enterprise because I felt like I needed to be a completist, and that by the end of season one, it was on like a radio drama. Like I would, it would be on TV, and I'd be doing, I'd be in the other room. Is Enterprise, the new one? Hmm? Is Enterprise the new one? No, no. it's the one where Scott, Scott Bakula Bakula was the captain. Yeah, huh? Scott. Bakula. I'm Quantum Leap. Oh. There yeah. you go. I didn't know. I used to love Quantum Leap. I didn't know. Quantum Leap was the joint. Yes, Saturday night. My mom was the longest Quantum Leap fan. Quantum Leap yeah. over here. Quantum Leap. Okay, Quantum okay, Leap. okay. Quantum okay. Leap. okay. I'm bringing us back, though, guys, because we are okay. 30 minutes in. Sorry. I just didn't know that he was. Guys, we just clearly movie. have to have brunch, all of us. We do. We really do. I know. Really do. I know. Good. We're all on the coast too. We got our New Yorkers over here and our West Coasters over here. I'm a Midwestern person, by the way. I don't claim West Coast. Just FYI. She just lives. I'm, I'm just here in the moment. It's fine. I'm um, well, I'm from Philadelphia originally, but I don't claim Philadelphia. <laughs> we all we all got what we got. Also, you have yeah. Robin? <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Um <laughs> How has some of these fandoms like inf informed your creative endeavors? Like we kind of talked about it with Dara, like you know, like loving comedy, and now you're you are actually doing like stand up. Um, Angelique <laughs> loving comics and now working at Marvel. <laughs> like, how are there like certain things in which you could you can kind of really trace how like consuming um, and becoming a part of a fandom has really like informed the content that you're, you are creating now. Um, K-dramas, is that kind of informing the kind of content that you want to direct and create, Eliana? Like, you know, you know I, everyone I, jump in there. No, no, I, I can, I can, um, yes, I will say yes. So I think my first fandom was just books and libraries. I don't know if that really counts, but like books and libraries were definitely the first thing that I consume. I think a library fandom is totally valid. I'm 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 in it, right? So um but like from that point to this point, actually before I even really knew because okay, I, I grew up on the south side of Chicago in the nineties. And so being like, oh, I want to direct movies and TV, it wasn't really a thing. Like I never even thought about it because it just wasn't something in front of me. You know what I mean? It's different today. We, we we all can imagine directing things and like film and TV is seems more accessible. But at the time, it wasn't really in my head of something I could do. Um, but I I used to with like the books that I love. Like the the very first thing I directed was Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry with my dolls, and I like had all the actors that were going to do the parts. I had cast you know Brandon Adams. Like I had really cast actors for it. I was staging scenes in my bedroom with the dolls, blocking it. And I didn't know what I was doing. I just needed to like do more with this thing. Um, and then funny enough, uh, when I became an NSYNC fan, especially from No Strings Attached through Celebrity. So I actually had a singing group myself at the time. And I used to, okay, <laughs> let's say, okay. Um, but I used to, and again, I still didn't know that I wanted to direct, but I was so into it that I used to write video treatments for some of the songs I liked off the albums. Again, like not knowing what was going on, I was just like, oh, we got to do the video because I was just like excited about it. And so I was, too used to make my basketball team reenact and I would put the song on and then I'd be like, all right, you'll be here and you'll be here. And I would do it because I would also make them come over because we would, I would throw birthday parties for each of the boys. That's not important. Okay. <laughs> um, but it sounds fun. I'm sorry I wasn't. In, I wish I'd known you back then because I would have made my way to California for these parties. Yes. Um, but so, so so I would say that all of the things that I've loved in that way have informed um me as a creative person, specifically because before I even knew what I was doing, I was needing to like express my creativity and I was using them as inspirations to do so. Um, and so like whenever they would do making the videos, I'm like, oh, I would have done the video this way. And I was like doing my little treatments and, you know, for no reason, I wasn't like trying to pitch it to NSYNC. I just knew what I wanted the video to look like. Um, and then of course you fast forward to, and also too, I thought they were just so creative and I was always like really inspired. And I was like, well, if I could do stuff as good as NSYNC does it, like, okay, I've made it. Um, because the, the execution is just 
there's nothing better. It's top notch. And then of course you fast forward. I'm in, I'm in Harry Potter and like that fandom, I started reading that fanfic. And then I was just like, I, I got to and there was a fanfic, I say it all the time, there's a fanfic that I really, really, really like. I wanted to make a short film out of it because it was just so good. It's a it's a it's a ship that's an embarrassing ship, but the but the writing in this ship is just so good that it's like, you know what? It is what it is. I'm here. I don't ship this in real life, but I ship the authors. <laughs> Um, I feel like that's a good transition because I feel like my expression of fandom has often been through fan fiction, um, but a thing that I didn't tell anyone I was ever doing. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so I definitely understand that like you fall into a story and you're like, I don't actually like this thing, but you wrote that really well. <laughs> so I guess I'm here right now. Um, and so I think I remember once I... Um, so I feel like one of my fandoms is just like TV also. And so a lot of things, fandoms that I've read for have been TV shows um, and like a few books, but mostly TV shows now that I think about it. Um, Sailor Moon was my gateway drug um, into fandom and nerdery. And then just like now thinking about it right now and the fact that like I write things for a children's magazine, a lot of those shows were children's shows. It's just like Sailor Moon, Inuyasha, Dragon Ball Z, Danny Phantom, Kim Possible. Like I just want a lot of fan fiction for a lot of children's shows. Um, it's fine. But um, yeah, I feel like once, once I interned at the New York Television Festival and they wanted to know like, what's a guilty pleasure you had. And I recently found the email where I was just like, this is a guilty pleasure that I am reading fan fiction and just the way that, um, it helped me. I didn't write any fan fiction until like three years ago, but I um, would be reading things and like, you know, a lot of it, 90% of fan fiction is bad. So like you'll start reading and you're like, you could have done this better and you could have done that better. And just like kind of self editing in my head until I got over it until I was tired of the story. And then I would leave <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, next one. And then it'd be like, oh, this is a really good story. And just absorbing all of the ways and in which those stories were good. Um, and I feel like that in in a different way than just like reading books, because those are, there are bad books, obviously, but like those all go through a specific kind of process, but fan fiction doesn't do that. And so it's just, it's just slightly different in the way that you can like look at a story and immediately be like, oh, the formatting's off. This writer's not gonna, doesn't know what they're doing. And I think that has also informed me as like an editor and being able to like quickly look at something and then like be able to like start moving things around because I spent so much time reading people's unfiltered, unedited often or like a beta Reddit, but it's also another friend of theirs that doesn't necessarily know what they're doing either um or like had to learn as they as they collaborated on this process um so it's just really interesting to me to think about the ways in which fan fiction has really like informed me as a writer and a and a editor and a fanish person because um we talk a lot in black Rose create about how like a lot of us came to harry potter by us we were doing it by ourselves and didn't really have another community of other people to do it with but um you kind of like do all these things by yourself and then you just you're your own fandom and i so i think that comes back to what you're saying earlier eliana just like a lot of things you just enjoy by yourself and i think that's still a, a bit of a fandom yeah that okay we're doing good transitions now so i'll pick up on that one um i kind of started in the same way like if we're talking about og og fandoms for me it would be like authors like um probably Stephen King I picked up my first Stephen King book when I was maybe like eight or nine years old it was just like this is it for me I'm gonna read every single thing this person like there were no more Stephen King books in the library after I was done with it I have read literally every single one um and like exploring that kind of passion for someone is definitely where any kind of like interest in fandom started with me David Sedaris is a similar thing like when I started reading it, I was like, oh, this is like a new thing that I haven't really explored before. And it made me want to like explore the forms, how I started doing storytelling. Um, another like another path in creatively for me has this gonna sound really bad, but like pettiness and judgment. Like I went to a solo performance show. Solo performance is uh, it's like a one man show, but ladies are allowed to do it now. So we call it solo performance. And I went to a show and it was, it was like, I was looking around and I was like, wow, this is not good. <laughs> um, but this person has like 
fans and people are excited to hear it. It was like, a, it was a black woman doing a show that was a little bit anti-black. So the white people were loving it because it gave, you know, it gives permission to be anti-black, but like in a woke way, because you're supporting a black woman kind of thing. And I was like, ooh, and she's being irresponsible. And so I <laughs> was like, well, now I will be a solo performer and I will do it better and I will be responsible and it'll be more well done because I have a background in theater. And so that kind of like kicked off my performance career where the performances were not like with other people, just like me being on a stage by myself. Um, and, <clears throat> Sometimes like fandoms and the stuff that I like is like great. Um, like when I look at something like Mike Birbiglia, I'm a really big fan of. When I look at the stuff that he has done is really inspiring to me. Um, sometimes the stuff I like is really discouraging. Like when I watch John Mulaney, I'm like, well, you're just perfect at that thing. So why am I trying to do this at all? Um, so I kind of like waffle back and forth from being like, oh, I'm never gonna be like that to like, getting energy from the stuff that that I like and, and watching other people create. Yes, all of that. Just <laughs> just reading people's stuff and you're just like, I could never and then or like watching, you know, Angelique do a panel and you're just like, wow, I could could never <laughs> why would I even try? Like that's whoa, whoa. just rude. how did I get here? Yeah, I feel like yeah, yeah. I'm right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just like <laughs> saw you at the bottom of the screen. Up. I just saw you at the bottom of the screen. I was just like, you know, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I literally have that for all four of you. So you know, it's fun, well, but think, also inspired by all four of you. So right. I love you. So, but Dara makes a really good point. And I think this is also segue. I actually, my fandom, which I don't really talk about a lot because I don't talk about book fandom because I do not read like I used to read when I was a kid. Don't, uh, we, don't, my, we don't have to go there right now. We don't have to go there right now. Okay. Yeah, like, right. But my fact that none of us read. <laughs> who was a doctor used to have all the Robin Cook books and all the Michael Crichton books. And I used to steal my sister and about the same age star, like we should not have been reading these books. Um, no, absolutely about the same not. age, I was picking up Michael Crichton and I was picking up Robin Cook and my parents, yo, did any of y'all have the Encyclopedia Botanica, but you only got like uh, certain letters like one M. Month, and you didn't have the whole set because your parents had to buy a book at a time, so they were on a payment plan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I, I, yes, we had the old Encyclopedia Britannica from like the eighties, which was white, which they got for my sister, and then we had the blue and gold one, which they were getting for me. Um, and so I would go and I would look all of this stuff up. I also diagnosed myself as dying several times, so it's not really healthy for a kid to. I mean, let's too much knowledge. It's like it's like WebMD, but. Um, this blend for me is that, you know, everybody looks at these books differently, but for me, I was like, I want to, I want to know more about why they told the story, why the story was like this. Why is the world like this? Why suddenly can this person do this thing? Like, what is a Deinonychus and why are you trying to recreate it? Like for me, it was always the why. And so like, that's probably for me, what influences me going into journalism uh, in, in, in high school, having a journalism degree in college, you know, going to law school, like all those things have always been the why and the story. Um, but also like what perspectives the writers had, like, I love Dr. Who and I think Tom Baker is great, but the reason why I am a Dr. Who stan is because the first producer of Dr. Who was a woman and the person who directed the first episode was a gay man of color. And so for me, my stands come from having this ability to tell diverse and incredible stories, but also going down these rabbit holes of why a person acts um, a certain way or why they write a certain way or why their, you know, their depictions of certain things are in, like being able to sit down and talk to someone like Aletha Martinez and, and, and really figure out that she was like, she went to school for drawing and she was like, bump this and then dropped out and then taught herself. I am an Aletha Martinez fan for the rest of my life because of her story, not just because she is brilliantly talented. And so I think the weird thing is like my my uber true fandom is just people and their stories and, and really getting caught up in the stories that I love. I love the Resident Evil stuff because Alice's story is traumatic and crazy and dumb, but the way they write it, her behavior makes sense. And it's great because it doesn't it doesn't have to conform. 
And so I, you know, and I think that's why I also love comedy because comedy is just storytelling. It's storytelling in sometimes a self-depreciating way, uh, but it's storytelling. And so when I, even when I think of panels now, I think of panels as a, a beginning, a middle and an end. And what is the story that that panel is telling the fans that they otherwise would not be able to get if it wasn't for me facilitating that conversation? Like that's, that's the most fun about it. I love you, Connie. That's the most fun about it because like when you sit down with someone and you don't want to ask the same damn question everybody has in the same way every single time. And so, you know, it's, it's, um, but it all started with books. It all started with this idea of world building and why did someone tell this story from this perspective? Like if you've never read a book called Grindel, which is um, someone telling the other side of Beowulf, it is fantastic. Cause you know, Beowulf is like, this big, huge monster, me go kill. And Grendel's like, man, why you come to my cave? I was good. I I wasn't going to do nothing, but you just decided you want to come kill my child. We got a problem. I, so, but yeah, that's my answer. Some Validoscope West in the chat says for her it was Babysitter's Club as a kid. I do oh. want to stress, I also read kids' books. So I read yes. Babies in this class. I, I was just, I'm just my I'm muting myself to say that I owned at one point 200 Babysitter Club books. Easy. My mother gave them to my cousin. She knows who she is. Oh. I still want my books back. I'm upset. I went to college. My mom was like, you were gone. And I was like, my mom did the same thing. What the my hell is wrong with you, woman? Book. Luckily, my mom was not that person. She kept most of my books because some of them were signed. Uh, but that's how I felt about Goosebumps. Like, mm -hmm. Goosebumps yeah. and Two Year Old Adventure were mm -hmm. my oh, I got, I got banned from reading Goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why, like, you guys reading all the Stephen Kings is hilarious to me because I read Goosebumps and my brother wouldn't let me sleep in his bed. And I think it kicked off my insomnia that I still suffer with to this day. And I would just, like, pace the house. <laughs> Like a ghost <laughs> at all times of night, and my dad was like, "You can't read these books anymore. Like we have to sleep. You're you're twelve. You can't sleep in this bed." Wow. <laughs> and I was like, "But I'm scared." <laughs> but wow. yeah, um, I was a huge Goosebumps fan. Of course, you were, Miss Stephen King. It. But also, side is thought of himself as a comedian, and Connie. He wrote for a children's magazine called Banana. <laughs> and he is hilarious. He's and hilarious he, in the driest way. Yeah, still hilarious. And um, I don't know, I, thought, I feel like I don't see him on Twitter as much, but a few years ago, he was like, fantastic Twitter follow. Lots mm -hmm. of like, images of Barbie dolls being taken apart. <laughs> <laughs> no, R.L. Stein, if you talk to him, man, all of his stories are based off of something that happened to him. Oh no. And like, so he's he's a little bit funnier than Stephen King. Because Stephen King also, like, a lot of his stuff is actually based off of like inspiration from his real life. Like Pet yeah. Cemetery, go read the story behind that shit. No, no thank you. Robin shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Robin should not do that. <laughs> but everyone else, yes. I will, I will take a strong pass. <laughs> Club, a I, 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 Connie, go, for, go listen. Like, did y'all know that Elle Fanning, so Audible just released the Babysitter's Club um, books again with Elle Fanning during the narration? Oh my God, that's oh, great. I, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I, just, I did a very deep dive. I, I was back in it for like two months. I was like super into Babysitter's Club. And it's just so good. And now the show's coming out. Gonna be very much into that, but Elle Fanning doing narration was quite fun. I was yeah. not a babysitter's club fan. I wanted to be. I was more like, "Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead." Like that was. I mean, great film, <laughs> fantastic movie. I'm right on that, Carol. <laughs> um. Okay, so we have all these stories of like really great, loving introductions and like inspire being inspired to create your own things from fandom. Has there ever been a time in which you've encountered, I mean, I'm sure that we've all encountered toxic fans, toxic people, especially living lives online, but has there ever been a time in which that has kind of 
stopped you from wanting to create work? I know that well, like, a lot of times I'll see people like put something out and then see the reaction to it. And I'm like, I'm never going to share anything <laughs> mm-hmm. ever again. Um, but has that ever happened with you? And how do you kind of push past that to continue to create and to continue to find joy in like the, in the things that you are a fan of? No. Um, I was going to say, I think for me, I, I don't know. Part of me feels like it might be a little different. Well, I don't know. By the time I was had made my first like official fandom for the world, like not for my friends, I was already a filmmaker. So was used to, you know, having projects that didn't go over with this person or, you know, getting rejected from festivals and all these things. So people not liking the work for me was just kind of like irrelevant. Plus, I'm not going to lie to you guys. It, it's the same as when I'm in like like when I work on on shows and stuff, I feel like in these spaces everybody whether it's like like i work on a lot of film and tv projects and and they make a big deal out of everything and and when i first started my career i was working but i was also taking the bus back to like harvey illinois if anybody knows harvey i mean it's basically it's it's rough and so i'd be like this just isn't that big of a deal sorry (laughs) So like people on the internet not liking my work, it's like, unless we're fighting, I, I don't care. Like if you're not in my face throwing punches, I really don't care. Yeah, like, I mean. Things happening in the world, like people have real problems. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I don't, I don't have any personal attachment to like a username with a problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, this is my fourth career, to be very honest. Um, and that's, that's not, that's like, that's not to say, stand, get yourself, like literally this is, I've, I have worked in politics on the ground and had like KKK folks like cutting my staff's lines in their cars in Smithville, North Carolina. So if you want to say something about my smile is too gummy or my voice is shrill, or I wasn't even old enough to see Space Ghost Coast to Coast, I give two rats ass. First of all, Thank you for the compliment, because I surely did watch it when it first aired. And, you know, it, it, it really is. And then I honestly, deep down inside, I go, them white boys who were showing up half dressed with no makeup on and their hair not combed, no, nor ass washed, who have been having these gigs long before me, they don't, they don't, they are not phased when people and and no 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 shade to anybody and there's no particular person that I am talking about just to be clear but it's like they don't care and and if you aren't like if 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 it's really that serious you know cuz I when I see stuff like what happened to Kelly Marie Tran like if it's really that serious then dude you got to get better priorities in life and so for me like most of the time, the people who actually like the stuff aren't the ones who are being uberly vocal online anyway, which is, you know, makes it such a skewed environment. But yeah, I, I, I agree. Like when you when you come from an environment where some of the stuff that you're doing is really life and death and like you come from an environment where you've 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 kind of done that, like this stuff is supposed to bring people joy. I same. Yeah, I, I, I think so. So I, I also I'm sensitive to the fact that for some people it is a problem and, and that it can um, stop some people from moving forward or from sharing their things. Um, I I just don't have that. But what? I am sensitive to the fact that it does happen. And I am sorry for the people that have been stopped uh, because of little people and little assholes. But I just feel like for the most part, it's like, again, you're, you're how, like, who even knows where this house is? It's like, meet me. If we're not meeting in Temecula, what are we really talking about? You know what I mean? But you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I agree. You, who are you? <laughs> like, I don't know, don't care. Yeah. I, for my part, I will say I have been impacted. Um, it maybe it, it doesn't necessarily dovetail into like fandom specifically, but a lot of my writing used to be a lot more political. A lot of my presence online used to be a lot more political, and I have kind of 
not shut down in terms of like my activism, um, mm. but insofar as my part of my activism was being very vocal and trying to educate, I have done a lot less of that because I feel like as a whole, I don't know if this is true or just my experience, but I feel like as a whole, the internet has gotten so much more toxic when it comes to that stuff. Um, and I also started getting death threats and it's like, not that I thought like somebody was actually going to follow through on the death threats, but I will, I just got tired. I got really, really tired. Um, and even now to this day, I will like open up the phone, go to tweet something, get halfway through it and be like, Oh God, who cares? And like, not who cares, but like, no, I do that like, all the time. The amount yeah. of tweets, the like amount of tweets that. that I've drafted and then been like, I don't care that much. Like I both don't care that much to like follow through on this thought, but also don't care for people's response exactly. to what that thought is. And exactly. so I'm just like in the good or the bad way where it's just like, I I don't care, forget yeah. it. And then I'll just select all and delete it. And it's just, just like, that's it. a lot of my Twitter presence. I do yeah. have to admit, I, I, yeah, there are certain things that I have or certain responses that I wish that I, like I'll draft a response. It's like drafting that email and you're like, or your last email. Yep. Right. And then you're like, but do I just really gotta get the out? energy out? And I, I think like, more people need to do that where they just draft it and then they delete it. Cause I understand the urge to get it out of your system. Like yeah. you feel someone and and even in the toxic, like angry way where it's just like, you know, Angelique said this thing about some nerd property and you're you, how dare she have this thought? But like you could just type it up and then have said it. And then delete it and then just like well, move on yeah. with your life. Like, I don't understand why you me. can't move on with your life. That happened to me on yeah. a video. They used the wrong take and we had taken another take and I said a particular character's name wrong. And no one watched the rest of the entire video because the fandom all came at me because I had said that character's name wrong but the producer had never watched the show. So they and didn't I had it. gone through and watched all of the seasons mm. before and, and literally it was just they were they dragged they dragged me for filth. Wow. Um, I will not name the show, uh, but I will say that it's just, you know, thanks for all the views though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I kind of, I definitely agree with this. Connie knows the story because it happened very recently. I accidentally got Raylos <laughs> in my mentions because I was not paying attention Didn't and I had a thought and, and I tweeted it and I moved did. on. I was at work. You know, you, had, you got a break at work. You look at your, your timeline and I tweeted, I, re I responded to someone, which was a problem and then moved on and got, and the next time I came to my phone, it had blown and I was like, oh, you know what? You're right, I did that, my fault. <laughs> because I should have paid closer attention to who I was responding to and the, like what that would bring. Um, but it does get annoying that you do, I mean, I think that more people should self-censor themselves, but it does get annoying sometimes to be like, I have this thought. Um, and I wanna share it the same way that anyone else would share their thoughts. And if you don't agree, either respectfully disagree or just move about your business. It's Twitter. There's a billion other tweets that you might want to engage with. <laughs> that's, that's actually why I so appreciate um, the shame. I'm still on Facebook. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you, it's really hard to do comedy and not be on Facebook for whatever reason. Comedians love Facebook. I don't understand what's going on. But <laughs> the, the kind of like fan pages, like the groups that I am a part of, are some of the healthiest that I have ever witnessed. And I really appreciate how like people will check each other. Somebody would be like, I watched this thing and I really didn't like it. Somebody else will be like, I watched this thing and I loved it. And somebody else will be like, it's okay not to like things. Like, <laughs> true. And then like, start sharing memes and everything's good again. Like that to me is the only place I have been where I feel like, Oh, like I can care about something deeply and keep my blood pressure down while mm. discussing it. Yeah. Yeah. Ironically, I'm about to have a show for our, the show on Tuesday for uh, the green space is about why are we so angry? And we will be kind of talking about this concept of <clears throat> psychologically over technology, like this anger uh, response situation of like, why, why are we angry about that tweet? Yeah. 
I mean, I went to, I, I resolved the thing by like, <laughs> love the passion guys. One, stop mentioning me because it had moved way past me. <laughs> it's like, please, Twitter also as a function, please make it easier to remove people's ads. <laughs> but like, it was like, please take me off the thread, but also channel that energy, create something yourself. <laughs> love, love the passion. Uh, Portia asked, and this is going to be kind of like our last question because we have to wrap up. Um, what brings each of you joy in being a creator and being a fan creator specifically? In being a creator? Yeah. Hmm. That's a good question, Portia. <laughs> I just finished writing 15 minutes of this, uh, literally not for 15 minutes, but a 15 minute keynote. Uh, my joy in doing this, since I unfortunately prepared for all of my week this week by doing one thing, uh, is telling the story. I mean, just telling a good story, particularly if it's someone else's story that may not have gotten told, and, and telling it authentically and genuinely and in a way that's both respectful and entertaining. Like, that's beyond, in, in every single thing that I do, that is truly what I, I I love about all of it. Um, when the joy moment comes when I'm like writing blazer a and it's like flowing <laughs> and I'm just like, this is great. This like feeling like the feeling when it's working, which doesn't happen very often. Um, but there have been a couple times, like specifically with fan fiction, because I don't have to create my own world. I just create a few characters. And then I'm just like, oh, and then they just do this thing that already exists. That part's great. Um, and then it's just like, oh, boom, 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 boom. It's like that feeling. And then you're like, I, you, you, you wake up like out of your like typing, like frenzy, like, wow, I just really wrote 8,000 words of that. Okay, great. <laughs> and I guess that happens with articles too. Cause like I wrote an article about Dr. Who and the episode aired and um, I was like, I, wow, I have thoughts, I guess. And then suddenly it was like a thousand words later. And I was like, okay, I did that. <laughs> um, but it, and, and I think it's just like chasing that feeling and wanting that all the time, but that's not a thing. So then you just have to go up to one of our other panels later this weekend and we'll talk about that part, <laughs> chasing the feeling. <laughs> I think to be honest, the, 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 the joy that I get, um, I guess it is just in the in the finishing of it, but I don't know. I feel like I, I get the most joy when I'm just like in moments like this, when I'm like connecting with other people that are fans of a thing. Um, I think that there's something about loving the same thing as someone else that just, I, I don't know, like it does something to you, right? And I one of the things I thought about like over the course of this conversation was I used to really love Power Rangers. Like I, I was like in it, heavy and strong. And I just remember like being at school and other and like some of my classmates like, oh, I like it too. And like realizing that they didn't want to spend the afternoon trying to like be characters and do the fights and like go on missions and being like transforming. Like they did it once and that was enough for them. But I was like, you know, really trying to be like pterodactyl and like really trying <laughs> to do it. And they just were not, they were like, oh, we did it, we're fine. And I was like, oh, okay. So everybody doesn't love things the same way. <laughs> Got it. And so then when you get to a point that you meet people that you that you can transform all afternoon as a Power Ranger, it's like, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened because you feel like all of this love for it. And and but then like being able to match that intensity with another person. I mean, it, it and then with, with a group of people. Oh, my God. Like it's it's nothing like it. Um, and so I think I can even say like when I did the Hermione show, one of the best things wasn't just. I mean, it was just really fun to make. I love production. I love directing. So anytime I'm on set, I mean, I'm having the time of my life. But then it would also be really fun either in the writing or in the production, like the other people that were fans. And when we would do like magic on one of the days, like looking at another Harry Potter fan on the set, that we also do production and being like, that was amazing, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was just, or even like writing stuff and coming up with, with concepts in the room with the other fans of Harry Potter. It, it was just, I mean, I don't know. That's what I chase. I'm chasing that connection. I think it's so like, 
It's like a drug. It feels so good. It's a high. I know we're running out of time, so I'll keep this really short. Um, in terms of the consumption piece, I agree with what everybody has said, especially Eliana, like having somebody tell a joke and knowing exactly why that joke is funny, but you have to have listened to like one episode of a podcast eight years ago to know is so deeply satisfying because they're all like, are you wasting your life? Maybe. <laughs> um, on the creation side, um, it is interesting for me because like I said, I do stand up um, and I'm in the Bay. So a lot of the rooms that I'm in are mostly white. Um, and the there's like, there's some joy that I get from that. Um, but a lot of people go there and they feel like they are like learning from me, even though it's funny. And I, I don't know how I feel about that. But when I get in a room with like mostly black people. Like I do this whole thing about like not thrill seeking because life is dangerous enough if you're black. And when there are black people in the room that are like, yes, I'm like, yes, I feel a connection <laughs> because I like, I'm so introverted and I live so much of my life just like between me and the screen or me at home with a dog. And knowing that you are living a shared experience with people is so powerful and so validating. So that's where I get my joy. Yeah. And I'm going to, that is definitely for me, that's it. Like there are moments where I'll like with all of you specifically on this panel, I have had a conversation with, I remember with Angelique, like talking Dr. Who and then like two weeks, if, if even two weeks later, you like dropped like <laughs> the thing that you wrote in my inbox. It was like one of the first, like the first uh, piece on uh, black girls create, which was, Black Girls Nerd Out at the time, but like the first thing that like, it wasn't written by either me or by Anna that we put up was from you. And like having conversations with Connie all the time about, you know, the different things that we love. Me and Eliana, I like went to visit LA and we like sat around and we wrote, like we were like talking about this um, idea for this TV show and we wrote it and like, or we're, we're writing it, ended up at the library, geeking out about our library fandom. Um, Dara all the time like we've just like sat there and like had long conversations about John Mulaney <laughs> and, and how did this get made which you put me on and then I was obsessed with and Jason Manzoukas and so like those right um and but like also being able to look at someone like Dara from Philadelphia but also like on paper our lives are very different but then like you meet them they have similar experiences they see the world the way that you do and then you say John like Jason Manzoukas and their face lights up and you're like, yes, like I am, I feel seen. <laughs> so um, that is definitely the thing that brings me the most joy. And the thing that I'm also just like, obviously as community manager, as a community manager, like chasing is like getting people to like do that and feel that and like make those connections with other people. So we're out of time, but I want to like, if everyone could just say like where we can find you, um, something that you guys got coming up and then like, let's, you know, offline, but like, let's just plan this brunch that we need to have where we can just like <laughs> do this. Um, and like, yeah, thank you all so much. But like, yeah, if you want to, we'll start with, um, start with Dara and then Angelique, Connie, Eliana, I'm looking at it in that square. <laughs> um, where we can find you and what, what, what's coming up that we should be on the lookout for. Um, I'm at Dara M. Wilson uh, on all the things. My podcast is at Money Ha Ha Pod, also on all the things. Uh, please include the M in Dara M. Wilson. Dara Wilson went to jail for hurting her children, and that's not me. I would never have children. Ha <laughs> um, That's a joke. Um, coming up, uh, I do a show, a monthly called Amazonians. Um, it's a monthly all woman stand up showcase here in mm -hmm. Oakland. It's wow. the second Thursday of every month. And we consistently just have like amazing heavy hitters. And it is a room that I always wanted to create uh, where, you know, nobody's going to be, you're not going to hear any ableist language. You're not going to hear any racist shit. There's no misogyny, it, but it's still funny. It's possible. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm up to. Uh, yo, uh, you can find me at Angelique Roche on the Twitters and at Angelique Roche official on the Instagram because the person who has Angelique Roche is never posted and won't give it to me. Um, mm, I, I have a, a show, uh, tomorrow, technically a keynote at the public theater. If you're in New York, please come. It's free. Uh, it's going to be at Joe's pub, but you get an RSVP. Check out my Twitters for all the information. 
Um, and then I just had a book come out, Marvel's Voices number one. Um, and by I just had a book, I mean, the podcast that I host just got a, um, a book and I, I wrote the intro in the beginning. It's like 1200 words, I'm in a comic book. It's like a big deal, I'm exploding on the inside. And uh, I'm gonna be in Boston in March uh, for Ace Comic Con. Um, what are they calling it? Northeast. Mm. Northeast. That's a direction. Uh, so it's gonna be great. Like Shamik Moore is gonna be there, which I'm really excited. Uh, oh, I have questions. Woo it's gonna be great. Uh, so that's that's coming up in March, as well as you know, just just stay tuned. I have a show on Tuesday, also here in New York. Uh, at the green space it's once a month called very biggest questions where we ask all the very biggest questions uh this month we're asking uh why are why are we all so angry next month we're going to talk about the digital divide and the whole concept is tech actually making us more divided uh and so it's interesting we get experts to come in we've got three panels technically we're not supposed to answer anything we're just supposed to make you ask more questions mm. Yeah. Uh, I'm Constar24 everywhere. Um, you can find me on the next panel in like five minutes um, and all in a few other Akumba Kitback uh, panels this weekend and during Black Wizard History Month. I'm just really on the Twitter and you just find all my things there. <laughs> awesome. Um, I am Eliana Direct on everything. My website, my Instagram, which I never use, but I, I will eat at some point in my life. Um, Twitter, which I have to start using differently because I am like applying for more directing gigs. And I realized the other day that my Twitter is a mess. So I was like, well, this is not anyway. Um, I'm Eliana direct on everything. Um, I, most of the things I have coming up are not within fandom. I did just direct a video, um, with, the Hermione from my web series being Hermione Granger in a fake presidential campaign for the Harry Potter Alliance. And that was really fun. Um, but most of the stuff I have coming up is actually not really fandom related. Although I'm shooting a short film this summer um, about two girls on the South side of Chicago, one of whom is a fan girl of a fictitious, um, of a fictitious show that I'm creating for her to be a fan of. And so that's going to be really fun. Just like exploring sort of like, the dichotomy of how you can be, how black people can be, you know, more than one thing. We can be from the hood and know how to navigate violence, but also still really, really be into like a fantasy show or just that like a lot for a lot of us, um, our worlds can, can exist in these two places. So that's going to be really fun. And that's what I'm doing. Yay. Yay. Um Thank you guys again so much. And if you're watching, please hang out for a few more minutes and then we'll be back with another panel. But thank you to Eliana, Connie, Dara, and Angelique. Make sure that you find them on the internet, catch up with all the wonderful things that they're doing. Um, if Eliana's directing it, it's fandom related because I am a part of the Eliana fandom. So boom. Um, <laughs> and we will see you at the next panel. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Hello. Hello. There we are. It's working. Yay. Yay. Okay, I'm gonna mute everyone until we get Portia back, but um and we can start. Okay. Okay, uh, so we're still waiting for Portia, but uh, we'll add her to the chat when she's ready, because, uh, you know, technology never loved Black Oaks Create um, and Wizard <laughs> Team. But uh, this is our Finding and Building Community panel. We're very excited to have our special guests here. Uh, and so uh, the two of you who are with us now, uh, please introduce yourselves, your pronouns, your Hogwarts house, and where you do fanish work. Robin can start, yeah. <laughs> I'm Robin. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I forgot to ask pronouns. Oh, I have to get better at that. Um, my Hogwarts house is Ravenclaw, and I am the community manager, co-founder, and um, contributor, I guess, of uh, Black Girls Create. <laughs> I was going to say, like... <laughs> I contribute things to Black Growth Create. Um, one of those things being that I manage our community. And that you created it. <laughs> I'm a co-founder. I know, but it's, it's, it's always weird to it's say like co-founder because that doesn't mean anything besides like, oh yeah, I had an idea for this thing and it happened. But also it That's happened. all any of it is. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it's fine. You're stalling so far she can get here. Go ahead. I Oh, Jesse, go ahead. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, my name is uh, Jesse Blount. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I primarily do fandom at my podcast, The Gaily Prophet, which is a queer Harry Potter reread podcast. And also, I write a little bit and it's on AO3, but. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Portia, move welcome. some of that from AO3 to Hogwarts be a few, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to work on it. We're going to work on We're gonna it. We're going to work on it. <laughs> Portia, perfect timing. Please introduce yourself, your pronouns, your Hogwarts house, and where you do fanish work. I didn't hear the last one. Where you do fanish work. Where are you fandom. Okay. <laughs> um, Portia Patterson Hurst, Ravenclaw. And I still don't know. I still can't, I don't know what's going on with my internet. Oh, no. But yeah, I'm on okay. our end. On our end, it's okay. <laughs> um, what do you do uh, in fandom spaces? Um, I so I volunteer with the Harry Potter Alliance. Um, I was the research team lead, which was um, whatever we were. There's some functionality of it now, but we're kind of like changing, um, especially now that the previous president of the org 
like left like the past year or so and so they're trying to like rebrand the thing um how like hpa works but formerly that the research team was about like pulling together different topic areas and doing articles like more relevant articles and sharing it within the staff so then all the volunteers would know um a lot more about what was going on on like climate change um i was on racial justice there's people doing lgbtq and gender um, news, just all these different aspects, kind of like making sure like everyone who volunteers with HPA, because it's a volunteer led organization, um, had all that information. And like, we also shared it out on their Medium page, which is pretty cool. If you check it out, the, the, if you look up the Harry Potter Alliance on medium.com, you can find their running feed of information. And then, of course, I am the um, director of strategic partnerships for Black Girls Create. So always on doing cons and behind the scenes, like partnership manipulations, if I can think of them. Um, <laughs> so that's your her inner Slytherin being like the <laughs> partnership <laughs> manipulation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm Connie, managing editor of Black Girls Create, a professional writer, which is still weird to say in the real world. Um, I don't know why it's been three years, but it's fine, whatever. <laughs> um, and yeah, this panel is about finding and how uh, difficult, but also rewarding that can be in uh, online and fanish spaces and how you can kind of do that better uh, and, and things like that. So let's start with like each of yours first experience with Fanish communities? Like what was your introduction to that? Or to, yeah, to Fanish communities and things like that. I can start. Um, <laughs> so my introduction was really, um, I talked about this in our last panel, in sync. Um, in sync, uh, going into looking, I, I was really big at like trying to find not bootleg, but I guess bootleg, like a lot, I would call them live audio clips of songs and certain, and the ways in which they would change their live performances. Um, and so I, from, from looking for the newest or the latest um, audio track, there are, there were a lot of message boards and like Yahoo groups and things like that. And I was a very, to say I was a very good kid seems really like, I don't know, like stuck up or whatever, but I was a very like rule following kid. Um, I just took like certain rules for a long time. I took certain rules as law and like my parents said I couldn't do this, so I don't do this thing. So I had like, you know, being 13 or 14 had like pretty strict internet usage and like how long I could be on the internet and what I could be on it for and stuff like that. Um, I didn't very much stray outside of that. And I, one of the major things being a, a, the daughter to a black mama, so I couldn't talk to people on the internet. So um, I would post on the fan boards or I would like read a lot because I'd be looking for like new songs that I hadn't heard. But I would also see like a lot of the conversation which I wouldn't join in on because that is then technically talking to strangers on the internet um, or talking to strangers full stop. Um, but that was my introduction, like that people did that, that they would share stories, that they would like make friendships and connections with people. At a certain point, I realized that people like on like certain message boards and like Yahoo groups would like meet up and buy tickets to concerts together. And I was like, oh, but y'all don't know each other. <laughs> That's scary, <laughs> which is a thing that I do now <laughs> as an adult, um, but uh, yeah, so that was like my first introduction to those communities. Um, and it then for a very long time, because I was a kid that followed the rules as if they were law, it took me until I was an adult, an actual like late 20s adult to be like, oh, I, I can talk to people on the internet now because I decided to do that. You gave yourself <laughs> like my mommy's answer. rule no longer applies because I'm an adult and I pay rent. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But the majority of my growing up, it was like knowing that those things existed and seeing them and not usually coming from finding them in like a Google dive into like NSYNC or Harry Potter um, and being like, oh, people are out here talking to each other. That's cool. I can't do that. I'm not allowed. <laughs> uh, I, I will go next. Um So my first introduction to 
online fandom was actually via the X Files okay. uh, because of an article in Yahoo Life magazine. <laughs> Yahoo okay. was really out here. They were. I, mean, I, I, I was a member of a lot of uh, those uh, Yahoo groups. Yeah. Um, it so, was a time in our lives, you know. <laughs> I, I remember that, but I think the. I didn't really start getting actually like involved in like message boards or online community until I was like in high school and uh, I was obsessed with probably in order Harry Potter and the Matrix. <laughs> um, and there was a very active, at least at that, at least at that time of the early 2000s, a very active uh, Matrix fandom. And I was definitely like on like a, an online forum where people would like talk about the movies and like write fan, all right, fan fiction and stuff. And then for Harry Potter, basically I made a live journal account so I could like comment and follow like authors that I was reading. Yeah. And I mean, it was pretty great because I didn't really know anyone else in real life. Um, who was into Harry Potter and the X-Files and the Matrix as, as much as I was. <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, I need to go find, I guess I can talk to people on the internet now. That's cool. <laughs> so that is why I got into that. And I've literally never <laughs> looked back. <laughs> Poor yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> I, I I think I've, I've talked about this many times. Um, so yeah, I li really just kind of like read Harry Potter and that was like the, I mean, there were other books that I got really into when I was younger, which were like uh, the Redwall series, which is like all these like animals, like in medieval times and they have vittles and it's really cool. Really into that series. Um, I was also really into, um, the Circle of Magic series by Tam uh, Tamara Pierce for a good second. And then, but the thing that really caught me and like kept me and made me like become an like a fan was Harry Potter. Um, and so reading Harry Potter, I like was really into it. And I, you know, we, I was part of the generation that grew up with like the internet and the chat rooms and all this stuff. So I knew that stuff existed and I like went to school and I had friends who were also interested in Harry Potter and we were talking about random crap. Um, and I was never the friend that was like interacting with other people like online about Harry Potter. They were, and like one person like swore she was in a conversation with Tom Felton <laughs> um, and asked him like what kind of toilet paper he had and like what toothpaste he used. <laughs> like, these are suspiciously American brands for him to be British. I don't know if you're actually talking to Tom Felton. So I think from her like, like hearing the kind of experiences, I never got interested in like interacting with people. So I'm like, People are like bluffing online about Harry Potter. And I don't really care to like get into that. Um, so it really wasn't until, and then like even like later, I think it was like whenever there was a break after like fourth book into like a fifth, um, there was like a lull. And I was like, well, maybe I'll just like, maybe I don't want to interact with people, but I'll just read their stuff. So like maybe I'll get into fanfic. Um, and then I just like, I think I read too many fanfics in a row and like right after I like read the fourth book. Yeah. So I kind of like put integrated them into the actual canon of Harry Potter mm -hmm. before the fifth book came out. I was like, I can't yeah. do that to myself. So I can't read fanfic anymore until yeah. after the books are over. So That's I just, what like, I did. I literally, I dreamt about it. I dreamt and weaved them together. So I just couldn't do, so I literally was outside of the like online fandom completely until, um, one day I randomly heard about this um, young black woman starting a Harry Potter podcast and I followed her on Twitter. And then I was like, oh, the podcast is coming out. I'm gonna start listening to it. So I started listening to it. Um, and then it's already like randomly tweeting back for like my MVP and benched. And then it became a whole thing. Wow. <laughs> what was Same this podcast down. called? <laughs> I wonder if <laughs> maybe we got into the same podcast around the same time. Right? I what love the call. Story, right, this happening right now. I love Hashtag it. Hashtag wizard. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I love that familiar. podcast. It was so you know, good. They like so moved on. It they moved on to some brow. weird stuff now. Like they no, but they moved on to some weird stuff now. So I don't know if I they're know, like gonna I last very much longer. But <laughs> like, 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 like Prince, whenever he's like going through his like yeah. he's going through the symbol period. I feel like mm. that's what they're going through right now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they have um, to revitalize and and remake themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, hilariously, was just talking to Brad about this, and I was like, it's funny because literally, Connie and Portia were like 
our only listeners. <laughs> at least it felt like that. They were our first listeners that like talked back to us. <laughs> and like now we're like friends and fam, like we're fam now. But like it's I was like, yeah, I mean it's weird because like we, you know, Connie's our cousin, but like that's that's a weird thing that happened on the internet. And then we we're because like, Because you made this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty but crazy. You were, you two were like our only. <laughs> What it felt like. It felt like sure. we were putting out this podcast and Connie and Portia were listening to yeah. it. We could have just sent you the, the audio directly. <laughs> could just, just like come over in and just been like, we're just having this conversation. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why we had to feel the need to put it on iTunes or whatever. The only people that listen to it. I mean, I'm glad that you did. <laughs> Harry Potter Book Club. It would have been great. It, it would have been around, great. It was, and it was really great, too, because it's like, there are some things about Harry Potter that I literally was like, when I read it in a book, even like my 11, 12, like growing, because I was growing with Harry Potter at like the same ages or whatever, even myself, I was like reading Harry Potter and I was like, side-eyed and hearing like half the whole time like this is my hero this is what I'm on the journey with I don't know I don't I was with him until that fifth book and then oof what's going on? I don't know so like having Viana and Robin just like kind of have their their gaze and their interactions and talking about it I was like somebody gets that part of my brain where I was like I don't know about this Harry boy he's not <laughs> And it was just really gratifying. So I feel like that's what pulled me into like, okay, this is this is my people, this is my fandom crew, and um and interacting with Robin and her like lauding the Harry Potter Alliance. So I was like, I gotta I should talk to these people. That's when I started working um volunteering with Harry Potter Alliance. So it really was like through the grace of Robin, I can be a full fan. I should also I admit a realization. Admit that like Oh no, go ahead. I followed the Harry Potter Alliance and I literally to this till still to this day, like even knowing the executive director and like the people that are like doing the work in my head thought that they were like, I don't know, like the Sierra club of Harry, like, <laughs> of like in terms of like nonprofit, like Harry Potter dumb. Um, and I followed them on Twitter and stuff. And like, I knew like what they'd done. And the first time that like, I'd met like Janae and Katie and they're like, Oh, Hey, like we love you guys. And I was like, Y'all even know who we are. Like, <laughs> you're the HPA. Like, whoa. Um, so yeah, also and- shout out to Harry Potter Alliance because that was another big part of like what I understood to be fandom. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the chat. Really great- oh. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a really great thing, uh, organization to think of as like fandom versus like mm-hmm. terrible, terrible, oh. terrible fans on the internet. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in the chat, just justice for Amani. He was justice riding with Imani. us. Yes. He was riding with us, me and Portia, as like the three commenters on the tag. <laughs> you know, I just had to put it out there. He commented. He said, he was, the eraser. he was also there. You know, just, just want to acknowledge you. This panel, about, so I didn't. Right. Yes, the panel's you. about community. So we just want to make sure to acknowledge the early members <laughs> of our community yes. here. Yes. Um, also, I had, Deb. also, Deb. She was part. She was yes. There. Deb yes. was also there. But that was, yes. Deb, Deb was me, though. So that was wanna... direct line <laughs> from to to me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but I I uh, have a similar with Portia, just like I didn't have friends who were as into Harry Potter as I was. Um, so I wasn't like, or maybe people were, but they, we didn't talk about it in that way. So I had no idea. And so a lot of the things that I was into, I was just reading fan fiction for, or like with Harry Potter, I read fan fiction after the series was done, but I would consume uh, essays and like buy theory books and like hear all the Easter eggs in Harry Potter, um, all of that by myself. And I guess I was gonna say, I was like, well, Black Girls Create was the first time I had a really real community. And then I remembered um, the website that shall not be named and <laughs> all the friends that I have from there that um, it was a community of people. I think, you know, live tweeting TV, was a way that I know, became began to know a lot of people on the internet, um, on Twitter, and um, and that kind of just communal watching space um, was a thing. So I think that was probably the first time I was just like, oh, this is what it's like to like have other people who like know know things as much as you do and like care about it as much as you do and like want to spend time talking about it in the same way that you do. Um, but you know, we don't have to talk about some of those other aspects of that community. And uh, yeah, so what, I mean, once you've become part of these communities, what 
are some of the things that you were uh, wary about, some problems that you may have faced um, that as you became creators of communities yourselves um, that you wanted to like counteract? Like what are things that in some of these early spaces that you were in that you didn't feel comfortable with, things like that? Jesse, do you have a, an example on the Yahoo on the Yahoo forums? I feel I feel like it's hard for me to say because when I was on those when I was in high school, I early spaces that you were in that you didn't feel comfortable with, things like that. What? What is that? Is that my internet? No, it's my thing. I was trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like when I was in high school, I was maybe not as critical of my fandoms at the time. But I mean, and yeah, I do know that, like, there. <laughs> and I do know that part of what drew me to the Matrix fandom in particular is like watching a movie that had like more, like a sci-fi movie that had more than one brown person in it. <laughs> right. And so I'm like. This is great. But I'll I take it. <laughs> yeah, right. Mainly more when I got older, like when I was like in college and like after I graduated college. So like 2010s um, is when I was like, wow, like what an unbearable whiteness of fandom. Uh, I was, I got really heavy into the Buffy fandom after I graduated college because I was sad and lonely. And that's a very white yeah. Oh, yeah. fandom, a very like white feminism fandom. Uh -huh. and it kept being like, wait, why is no one writing about Kendra, the Black Slayer? She's clearly awesome and she shouldn't, she should have lived way past like this. <laughs> and then right. I'm like, oh, oh justice for Kendra. Slayer that's quite killed in the 70s was black. Oh no, no. And I'm just like, we are not what doing are this doing? today. What? <laughs> and I'm just like, and none, none of y'all are talking about this. I'm like, and I'll read it fake. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, Forrest in season four was an asshole, but you didn't have to make him a rapist in this fanfic. And I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. And it's just. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Frustrating. Shout out to all of the, well, all, I say all of the, I've read like, a handful of fics that are not posted on our website, but all all of those in which Kingsley is some big brute who's like chasing people around, and I'm like, I mean, just that's Joe's influence, you know. He's big, black, and bald. Like big, what black, and bald, know? and what black, and big. That's and bald. the personality: black, <laughs> bald, yeah, personality. Obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah that's I, a girl personality. I've definitely um, looked in fics where he's the villain. I'm like. But that doesn't make any, <laughs> any sense. <laughs> but y'all don't want to make the actual villain a villain? You don't want to call Snake? You don't want to make him what he is? You're not gonna... No. Okay. I'm not going to do that today. He's okay. white, guys. Obviously, he can't be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> white oh, a little sob. <laughs> um, I will say, like, going back to, like, Connie, you remembering a, a community that you were a part of. I'm remembering a community that I was a part of that was, like, directly proceeding creating Wizard Team and Black Girls Create. And one of the things that I learned, cause I ran social and I did a lot of like live kind of tweeting and stuff like that um, in those days was, I was very cognizant of like not wanting to have like basically like big name fans. I never wanted it to be, to feel like, I never wanted Wizard Team to feel like the community around Wizard Team is a community of Robin and Bayana fans as opposed to like, we just speak the things, but like everyone's voice is as valid. Everyone's thoughts and opinions are as valid. One of the things I loved is when we started doing, when we went on Patreon and we got like the the chat, the infamous chat, um, <laughs> was that like, unless, and this happened a lot. So, but except for the times in which the chat was wildly out, inappropriate, or wildly off topic where they were then going into the history of badminton or something while we were trying to talk about Harry Potter. Um, I always wanted to like include their thoughts unfiltered, like, and, and sometimes I would like, a lot of times Portia would say something about Molly Weasley and I would say it. And then I'd be like, I don't agree with that, but this is what Portia has to say. And it's just as valid as what like my, how I read this book, you know? And I think that that's something that I try to be very cognizant of um, as we as our community is growing as well as like 
it should not be that I say I have a thought or opinion about something and I say it and then no one feels comfortable to push back on that. And no one feels like um, because we are the ones that like host the podcast that we're the only ones that have any that validity into what it means to be a black Harry Potter fan. Um, or that like, again, like, and I'm sure that we've all like seen this is like blackness is not a monolith. So like um, that my interpretation of like this scene in the book is like the only way in which black people can interpret the scene or something like that. Like I always wanted to be sure that everyone felt heard um, and not everyone is hosting the podcast. That would be ridiculous. But like within the community that's built up around it, everyone is feeling heard and validated and like respected, except, you know, Amani, when I bully him, according to what he's saying in the chat right now, but like, um, <laughs> but even that, that like people in our community and our listeners feel comfortable enough to like make fun of us and laugh at us and also call us out, like, seriously call us out um, when we need to be called out. I think it's like something that was, I, I made a point, or I wanted to make a point to have um, when we started this. Did you have an example, Portia, or no? Um, I don't have anything like super, like uh, like a major challenge or whatever. That's fine. Like, when I first started the Harry Potter lines or anything, it's just mainly that um, everywhere, like everyone who's like running hair parlance is like very like hyper is aware how white it is. Like mm. their gender um, representation is really well. Like like it's like one of the best gender representations I've ever heard of for an org. Where it's like I believe it's like uh, seventy to seventy five percent women, and then the next highest like uh, percentage is probably like like in the ten teens, and it's like trans. And then the next gender is like non-binary, non-conforming. And then there's like maybe 2% male. It's very, very like, and this is like in the volunteer network. This is the amount of people who are kind of like coming to their events and doing these things. Mm -hmm. So it's very well represented gender wise, but it's very, very white. Um, And they like express like interest in trying to expand and like get more into communities of color. And I feel like that's one of my areas where I'm like, I kind of like have my like personal like battles of like not really battles but like okay like I do think that more people of color should be involved in this because they're doing really cool work but I also don't want to be in a position where I'm like oh yeah like these all these people of color like come on like come to this thing and then what, not be aware of something that they're uncomfortable with because I'm not personally uncomfortable with the thing um, and I don't think there's a lot to me but I also don't know right I can't speak for everyone. So I think that's one of the things like I see as a challenge in the hair power lines is just like getting being better about like talking to communities of color and involving them in work and we've talked it over with them and they're open to it, just actually implementing it, which I hope we can do soon. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a great uh, thing to ask uh, Robin and Jesse in terms of um, you've both like ended up creating your own spaces outside of existing fandom spaces. And I'm sure Je- uh, race had a part, a lot to do with that. Um, is there a sort of direct correlation to you creating your spaces because of race or was it just like, once you decided to create your own space, um, the, the the racial inclusivity uh, being better than maybe the larger Harry Potter fandom um, that just came as a natural ad of you being at the head of it. Is there a, a thought on that? I mean, we have black girls and we've always had black girls like very prominent in <laughs> our branding. Um, but I do think that like one of the things about Wizard Team was like I was trying to go to like listen to a lot of Harry Potter podcasts at the time and this isn't racial um or at least I didn't think it was it was racial but it kind of is is that there was a lot of just in those podcasts that I was trying to listen to I (laughs) to finish many of, of them if any of them um there was a lot of surface level reading of things or even like when they would have like more critiques about not the not the books themselves, but you know, like the things that are happening within the story. Um, 
Snape, for example, it was a, it was very, to me, it was like, they're not going in in the way in which I would go in. Or they're not bringing up a lot of things in the ways in which I would bring them up. Um, you know, like, Snape is mean. So, no, he's abusive. And like, I need you to use that term, you know, and I need like the toxicness of, of that to be like explicit. Um, there's a panel, I bring this up and I'm probably, I shouldn't cause like, I would love to be on the panel. I think I was actually on the panel once. Um, that was in, I was on the panel once, but that it happens at San Diego Comic-Con and um, they talk about Harry Potter and the fandom. And a lot of it was like, you can buy this merch and you can go to these things and you can go to this store. And I was like, talk about those systematic social justice issues within the book or the criminal justice reform that needs to happen and justice for Hagrid. And like, <laughs> those were like the conversations that I wanted to have. Um, and I think that like, even with like criminal justice within Harry Potter, I think that like, as our community has grown, I think there, that is a racial thing in which you would, as a person, like a person of color, but especially a black person in America, would mm -hmm. see that part of the story of how you can just take someone to jail and have no evidence and no trial and just say that well it looks good. Um, you're going to put your your you're going to put your experience in on that. Um, and it's going to inform how you read that story. And so there's a thing that I like to say, I probably say it too much, which is like, we're all reading the same books, but we're not reading the same stories because our experiences and our lens on life go in a lot into how we internalize and read these books. And so um, I do think that like explicitly what I, what I wanted in our community was a deeper look and to look into and to be like a critical fandom lens into it. I didn't want it to just be like, oh, magic is fun and cool. And like, aren't these books funny? Um, I wanted to go in on like, like Portia said, I wanted to go in on Fifth Year Harry. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, he's dealing with, and, and also because of our community, I went from hating Fifth Year Harry um, to having a more nuanced opinion of it and also being like, oh, no, 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 you're right. I don't hate fifth year Harry. I hate six year Harry. <laughs> 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 you know, I was, it was transference, but like mm -hmm. um, being able to like really deeply dive into those things on a beyond surface level. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to eating my hollow bread now. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I feel like getting deeper into the uh, actual uh, analyzing of Harry Potter is part of what uh, me and my co-hosts, you know, were like, we need to start this podcast. And I mean, I'm a black queer woman. There are not a lot of black queer women uh, who have podcasts about anything. Right. Uh, and I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of Harry Potter podcasts and there are a lot of people who are even queer who host Harry Potter podcasts. But mm -hmm. I'm like, I just wasn't seeing like, Oh well, I mean, I love Harry Potter, but let's talk about how fucking white Harry Potter. Like, let's talk about all the fucked up racial implication and racism that happens, and right, the yeah. fuck criminal justice issues. That it's like, as a black person, I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. Let's send everyone to the nightmare prison without any lawyer. Literal nightmare prison. Like, literally, you get nightmares. Literal when you're there. Like, depression. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. prison. Yeah. Even more than prison already causes people who have mental health issues. Yeah, but. Yeah, and so it was, it felt important to me because I mean, I've been talking about this shit about Harry Potter for years with people, uh, with honestly other black people who are also like, well, I mean, yeah, like let's talk about, let's get into this. And it's funny, I actually, I don't particularly like book five Harry, but I love book five because it's like radical education. They're like, oh man, this school fucking sucks. We gotta do this. <laughs> and I'm like, that is so relevant to kids who live in places where their education is shitty. I mean, I live in Detroit. We, yeah. have, there's a lot of issues with our public schools. Um, and so it's really like, I just love the idea of like, you know, the kids empower themselves to like learn what they're not getting. Even though let's be real, it was Hermione's idea <laughs> and Hermione pushed her into it. Yep. Um, the book should really be about Hermione, honestly. Obviously, absolutely. <laughs> That's why we're really all here is to talk about how Harry Potter should be about a <laughs> That could um, be a whole other two hour long conversation. Absolutely. Um, um, 
yeah, so in creating these communities yourselves or becoming a big part of them and, and with Portia and the Harry Potter Alliance, what are some of the benefits that you've experienced both for yourselves and also the people in the community that um, have sort of come along this journey with you? Uh, Robin's eating challah bread, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that- Sorry, so, sorry. Bread from Trader Joe's with the honey in it. Continue. <laughs> you have to try the, their babka with the chocolate swirl. That is the shit. I have. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> this is not a food conversation either. We'll do um, that later. <laughs> we've gotten a lot of feedback about people who have like, through listening to our podcast. And for folks that, that don't listen, we talk a lot about our queer headcanons. We're like... Basically, all the professors, almost all the professors are queer, and there's so many queer people, and there's so much queer romance happening in the background. <laughs> like, this is happening, and like Hagrid is a trans woman because she is so maternal and lovely, and she just wants to nurture every, you know, monster that there is around. And this is ride or die for this. And then some people write to us, and they're like, "Listen to your podcast has like really helped me like come out to myself and my family, or really kind of helped me like sort of." Uh, come to terms with my identity. And I'm like, that's big. This is not what I expected when I'm like, I'm just gonna talk shit about with these folks <laughs> and a friend and we're gonna laugh about how ridiculous I'll, like no, like their government is. And for someone to be like, for most people to be like, this has helped me like, you know, find something about myself is incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big. Anyone else? I, um, so as far as the Harry Potter Alliance, I've been, um, doing their booths for like a lot, for probably since like the beginning of my time Harry Potter Alliance. And like, so I've run booths at different cons. I've run booths, like, so, and the cons have been really cool cons, like LeakyCon, um, and then for American Library Association, they had the yeah. booths there and it's the best. There's just a lot of reasons to do it, but like, one of the cool reasons is you get a bunch of free books and the LA. Clearly, still reading those books. I, I, I really want to go and I have no reason to. Like, Portia and I both had like to mail books back, pack books <laughs> in our suitcases. My suitcase was My suitcase over the was limit. It was all books. Plus I had two boxes with me. It was great. I love That's it. That's fucking dreamy. That sounds incredible. Oh, be a librarian, go to the LA. <laughs> It is awesome. Like if you if you can volunteer to be there, it's it's and it's the librarians are amazing and they're so helpful even whenever they're like not even like on like being behind your desk or anything. But anyways, um, so yeah, ALA and then um and then also like their Yule balls and stuff like that. I'm always like I've been like behind the booth and running things, and it's always interesting, um, having like getting them meet people and have conversations with them and just like sometimes you have people just like like be friendly one day and they come back and they can buy something else or they like come and buy something because they just had a really cool conversation with you. Um, so I've really a lot, I've had a cool amount of like booth experiences and like two of my favorite ones have been like, I think they're both at the same LeakyCon. Um, one of them was I was at the booth and it was like the first day of LeakyCon and this like woman came up and she, we would just start chatting and she was a black woman and she seemed like she's by herself. And I was like, oh, like we, we start. I was like, oh, where where'd you come in from? She's like, oh, New York. It's my first time doing this con. I just felt like I wanted, wanted to come and try it out. And I was like, oh yeah, so you have like friends here? And she's like, no, I came by myself. And I was like, what? I was like, do you need friends? Do you want do you want friends here? And she was like, sure. I was like, okay, come back here later. I'll get like you can come hang out with us. Ah uh, yes. <laughs> it was so funny, and it but I felt really great. Like I felt the community like support that like. Like those create had like given me, and then like HPA had provided me the space to talk to other people who like would venture. Clearly, she's a Gryffindor, all the way to come all the way to Texas from New York by herself to go talk about Harry Potter all day, um, not knowing anyone he at the con, just doing it by herself. Um, and so then like she hung out with us like for the rest of the con, and it was so great because I was like, oh my gosh, like this is community in action. Like I just was part of this experience. Um, and then a second great um, interaction that I had at that con was that I was just talking to this lady 
and she was a Ravenclaw. She had this really cool Ravenclaw diadem pin. Now she's like exclaiming over it. I was just like, oh my gosh, where'd you get it? She's like, oh, this is this random loot crate box that came out and it just happened to be in there. It's like, oh, there's no way I'm going to find this. So I was like, I'm going to try to figure it out and try to find it. And then the last day of the con, because I'd been like so, like, I talked about it like multiple times during the con and I'd seen her around or whatever. I was just like, I just chatted with her, not about the thing, but just about like just to her. Um, she like made my, like, she just made my day. She came to the end, to back to the HBA booth at the end of the day and was like, this diadem is yours. Like, I don't feel the way that you feel about this diadem. It clearly means so much to you. Like, I don't, this is not my diadem to own. It's your diadem. And I was like, oh no, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like the, one of the sweetest things that anyone's ever like, like, you know, who goes to a stranger who just is like admiring some random thing that you own and is like, no, actually, this is yours. Like, that was like a powerful kind of like, oh, like that's, this is like one of the things that you don't really expect to come out of having conversations with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of like, it helps me see myself and growth as well. Like, you know, I used to be like a shy kid who was like reading in her room by herself. I am still mostly the introvert that goes back to her room and writes and reads to herself. But at least like, I know, like I, like when I have social interactions with other people who are into the things that I'm into and it's really great, it goes really well. And I think about myself like, okay, like look at me, like as a person, I'm sitting over here, like making like really deep connections with people. And there's time, just because I decided that I was gonna be helping out at a booth and talking the most, I probably have talked to people in like months. <laughs> a lot of talking. I mean, it's not always about sales. It's just like hearing people's experiences, talking about Harry Potter. It's where we all are. Um, so it just, it felt really, it always feels really magical to be behind the booth and to like work around the the, uh, the cons. Cause even like at ALA, I get to talk to really cool librarians. So I'm like, in one of my other lives, am I a librarian? So I think I, I want to be a librarian. So it's just it's a lot of really cool things um, being part of the discussions and actually representing a community and talking to other people about this larger, greater community that you're a part of. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to do a con whenever that actually happens. <laughs> <laughs> that will be so good for you. You'll have the best time. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you guys um, avoid some of the pitfalls of your own natural blind spots when creating a community that either you are still grappling with or there are other communities that you've observed and want to avoid those things? Like, What are the lessons that you've learned about how to create an inclusive community? Um, I think that creating an inclusive community just means being open. Like, honestly, communities are dynamic. It's the thing I like the most about doing community work. They're dynamic every day. There's a, um, the interactions change. They're people based. Online community, offline, like offline community. They're people based, and it's only as um, It's the, the, the community is only as inclusive as the people within the community allow it to be and will it to be. Um, and so you need to make sure that you have two things. You have buy-in from everyone in your community that it's going to be an inclusive and accepting and welcoming space. And you are very clear and you know who your community is serving and what it's serving. So it's very clear to me um, when we started our community, Early on, we were like, we just want it to be black girls. And I was like, you know how hard that is to like, one, I don't want to be in the business of policing anyone's blackness. Like, if I don't know you and you, all I see is like a screenshot or like an avatar. Um, and my initial reaction is like, oh, as someone who has spent the majority of my life being told I wasn't black or not black enough or I'm Mexican or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. Like, I'm not trying to be like, the person that is monitoring or policing how someone identifies in any way, especially because identity is also a fluid thing that moves. I mean, not your race, Rachel Dolezal. (laughs) There's a line at Rachel Dolezal, but (laughs) there's nuance in the conversation beyond that. But as as of saying that we have a community for black women, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like womanhood is a fluid thing. (laughs) It moves and, um, and so, to me, it was very much like, okay, our community is open and anyone can join. Um, it is 
we prioritize the needs and the safety of black women always, because that's who I think um, the community and, and who needs us the most. So if you're a cis white dude and you come into the black girls create community, you're welcome there. But as soon as you start to like prioritize yourself, center yourself, you you gotta go and maybe it's it's as harsh as like me as all of a sudden like you can't get in you've been blocked you've been banned or you know it just it's a subtle like this is not for you um and all and trying to reiterate that all the time um we've we've gone through things like that before too where someone will say something and it's not malicious and i, I have a, another fundamental belief of never assuming intent um i don't assume that some unless it's completely obvious, I don't assume that someone's trying to, you know, cause harm, but that doesn't mean that harm isn't caused. And so we have to call it out when we see it and let them know like, hey, we love it that you're here. You bring, every person is unique and everybody brings something to this community to make it what it is. But <laughs> this community is not for you. You're welcome here, but who we are serving they're prioritized. And, if, and the minute that they don't feel comfortable, the minute that they feel silent, like you have to change, not them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is how I go about it. And also I think with the same, at the same time, I, I'm, I want to be, and I hope that I reiterate this enough and I, the people that are listening and you're part of our community, I'm reiterating it again. Um, I get things wrong. I, I make mistakes. I, well, I can be not inclusive. I can be closed-minded. I can say things. And again, my intent may not be bad, but that doesn't mean that my impact is not harmful. And so just because my name is on <laughs> the thing and I'm community manager doesn't mean that I'm, I don't, the, the guidelines don't apply to me as well. Doesn't mean that like, I can't be called out or can't be, I can't learn. Um, and I think that like, as someone who is introverted, um, with a lot of other issues, <laughs> there a lot of issues, guys. Like this, you know, it's a thing a thing. <laughs> there are a lot of things in which, um, a lot of places in which I can continue to learn from people. Um, there are a lot of times in which I feel like sometimes I'm a little mean to ext not mean to extroverts, but I'm a little judgmental <laughs> of extroverts <laughs> in a way that like. I think it's just, I just like, man, y'all be out here. Y'all just wild. Like, now I don't want to see you. I don't want to meet you. You know, and that come that can come off as mean. You know, I'm like, y'all just want to hang out? Like, who does that? You know? Um, but that's my own personal lens. And that's like how I, you know what I mean? But I don't want that to be like, I don't want someone who is an extrovert who does want to hang out and go meet strangers to be like, oh, I don't belong here. You know what I mean? Exactly. Portia, like, my face might do that. But that doesn't mean that you... That's not a like that is the completely valid way of being, and we need extroverts, you know what I mean? Like, we yeah, need them the to exist for like this could be strangers, just but we right. all we but, did that though, yeah. <laughs> as introverts, we banded together. That's the thing, though, we banded together and then did it as a group, you know. So that helps. We also <laughs> met each other have a thing in common from yeah. the comfort of our own homes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of times like, you meet the person first online and then right. you meet I the love person. hanging out with y'all uh -huh. while I'm also alone in my room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Correct. Do I have to go anywhere? No. Did I have to right. change a shirt? Probably. Yes. Right now. Yes. Right. Just a shirt, though. Just a shirt. Just a shirt. <laughs> I mean, and honestly, the people that I reach out to, I did like sell the Kumba kickback as like, it's a hangout. We talk, we have a good conversation. You don't even have to wear pants. Like, I'm like, to me, that's a selling point. To other people, maybe not. But like, I am. I'm wearing pants. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, like, you know, like, but I, in when in terms of building a community, I'm. I may not see that as being exclusive, right? I may not see my like visible yikes at yeah. your like outgoingness as being something that might cause people to feel excluded, but it does, and I need to check that when I do that. Um, and I, and I need people to feel comfortable being like, that really hurt my feelings. Because also, a lot of times, too, I'm saying it as a joke or, you know, like, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I might yikes you, but I don't mean that to be a, an actual judgment on you. It's more of a judgment on me, to be honest. But, like, um, <laughs> I, but because in my head I said this thing and I thought of it as a joke or I thought of it as something that we all laugh about or whatever, um, 
if it hurts, if it hurts someone, I, I need them to call me out on that. So I'm aware. Um, and I'm not above that either. So mm -hmm. that's kind of my thought process there. Yeah. I mean, like no one is perfect and it's really just important to be able to not be eager, like to take your ego out of it when someone gently calls you out um, mm -hmm. or even not so gently, depending on how much it hurts them. Uh, at the beginning the first, I don't know, 10 episodes of, of our, of the Gaily Prophet um, talking about Sorcerer's Stone. Um, we were like, where is the witching world CPS? Like someone come help this poor child. And then someone <laughs> were into us being like, CPS is fucked up. But it's like, oh my God, you're like, yeah. Oh, why are we wanting right. this thing when it's like CPS just hurt so many black and brown people. <laughs> and it's like, you're so right. We we're so sorry that we were being very flippant about CPS because that shit is not, it's not, it's not a joke. And mm -hmm. like we said, we had an apology because we we're like, this person was right. This is fucked up. You know, um, and you just I would to like to apologize <laughs> right next, now. Next episode on Wizard Team. <laughs> and I will call the next episode of all of the time. I am also called for the Wizarding CPS. Because like, we need something to help. To help. Like, Harry should not have been in that position. What? Yeah. You usually say social services. Like I do. Umbrella term, not like the, the specific. And also the uh, like idealized version. The idealized like, version of works yes, and if is it an abusive. The way that it was supposed to. Yeah, be. yeah, yeah. yeah. Some but, of yes. that is some nuance and underlying things that maybe you just need to say and then you can move on. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's a great, sure. yeah, that's a great example of something that like you have all these listeners now like oh, people are actually listening to the things I say. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And like, yeah, I mean, you can't, you have to be, I think, gracious about it because people are doing this like, I want to keep listening to you. You should, you, we want you to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. um, not unlike, I don't know if any of y'all ever listened to My Favorite Murder, but those ladies <laughs> were called out over a lot of things and were just like, we're just going to keep doing this thing. And it's like, no, no, mm. girl. Or maybe the author of the series that we've all been talking about. <laughs> Wooey. Maybe. Oh, man. Her chance? <laughs> oh, sorry. Don't know, Don't know her. Um, <laughs> how do you guys find people to join these communities that may be looking for them and don't know how to find them? Like, what is that challenge like? Um, The internet is a beautiful, <laughs> the internet is a hell of a drug. Um. <laughs> Truly. I think it's a lot easier now than it was like growing up. I, there are a lot of, I think that there are a lot of ways in which I would have been a nerd or been much more involved in communities had I known that they existed um, or tried to have been. Cause I don't know. It, Cause even still, like there were some communities that I knew existed and also knew explicitly were not for me. Um, but if I would have known about them earlier, I might have tried to have tried to join. Um, Google is a wonderful thing. A lot of people find our community and we ask the question, like, how did you find us? And a lot of people are like, Google search. And I'm like, what y'all searching for? <laughs> <laughs> what are these Black keywords? Black 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 Harry Potter. Right, what are those <laughs> keywords? But um, <laughs> are there Harry Black Potter? Potter. Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just doing that. And then I think also just, sharing what we're doing like so a lot of it too is right now we're in the middle of black wizard history month and a lot of people found us be the first um maybe not the first year we did black wizard history month but the second year when we started to make it a much bigger project shout out to Bayana for um doing the most um in the best always. way but always people would start to like you know see that hashtag and then that's the first time that they saw us. There was a time when Black Hogwarts was trending. And I don't know, I still don't know to this day who started that hashtag, but awesome. No idea. We jumped in on that and a lot of people found us from there. Um, and I think it's just a matter of like, loving the thing that you love and making sure that you're not doing it in a bubble. You know, like, I always say this as like, someone who, I don't know why I'm bringing up dating, but I don't date. And I'm always like, if someone <laughs> knocked on my door, and then we could just skip to a three-year relationship. That'd be awesome. Right. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to do that, like, the in-between stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to do the, like, I'm comfortable. Let's hang out on the couch and, like, 
whatever. And watch TV. And watch TV. Exactly. I mean, I'll know that if it, if it were just any person, you'd be like worded out, like, how the F did you find my effing door? Exactly. Unless it was JC Chazé. And he's like, <laughs> I'm going to know where to find me. Okay. I've been waiting for you to get the here. Welcome home. You. <laughs> Welcome home. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so like, I, I already have all of your favorite things, things here. <laughs> yeah, I already. I always talk about how like I would like that knock on the door, but also knowing, like Portia said, like knowing that that knock on the door doesn't exist because how the hell would they know where I live? Especially because I make a point to like you know not have my shit public because people crazy. So like, um, so that's a very it's it's very similar in terms of finding and building community. It's like you have to put yourself out there. You have to talk. You have to go to cons. It's exhausting. I know. I live it too. But like, <laughs> that's the only way in which you actually yeah. find people. If we would have mm-hmm. continued to have our conversations about Harry Potter, just the two of us in the living room, we wouldn't have this community. And if we would have like done this podcast and like not been, not put it out on Twitter or like asked people to give their thoughts on Twitter, we it would be much smaller. If we wouldn't have gone um, to conventions and spoke or, you know, it would just, it would, it would still not have grown. So um, you find people by just being where people going where people go, which mm-hmm. is sucks and it's exhausting. But you do that, and then you go home and you like hibernate. You know yeah. what I mean? It's all about balance. Balance. Yeah. yeah. For me, like in talking about my earlier point about how the Harry Potter Alliance is aware and they need to be, bring in more people of color. Um, I think a lot about how I can't like as a black woman, I have a tendency to want to be available for like being aware of other people of color, like what like some of their needs may be or like what could be helpful to like mm. how to bring these people in. But then I recognize that's not my place to speak for another community, like what would bring them in, right? So I I we've talked, spoken a bit about how when HPA does like Granger Leadership Academy was one of their like bigger, like their only of like big events they actually run themselves for every year. Um, that how to actually engage the local communities. <coughs> Sorry about that. Bless you. <laughs> um, we try to like engage local communities and be like better aware of like there are whenever we went to, and this is something that even that like even like bigger like people who have like a broader range of like marketing and stuff like WikiCon, we went to in Dallas, we walked up to like, we went to go eat dinner. Um, and there was this woman who was behind like a cashier at a, one of the places that we went to eat. And she mentioned that she had no idea that there was a con about Harry Potter in her city. And, and it was literally like down the street. We were like, we had we walked, walked over there from, walked the there from the convention. <laughs> yeah. It really yeah. Was. And so, like, that's what I, it, that's what kind of, like, makes me a little, like, apprehensive about, like, there are, there are ways to better, like, intervene and actually talk, talk to people, like, where they are. Like, you're literally coming into someone else's, like, space and environment, and if they don't know that you're there, then you're not doing something, right? So that's what I'm trying to be, like, helping um, the Harry Potter Alliance to do, so, like, how do we identify those communities? What are the what are the places that people go to get information about things about what's going on in their community? Is that like the library? Is that the community college? Is that not on not in person? Is it something that they have to like see on Eventbrite or something? Or where are people scoping these things out? And how are we better going to communicate to the people that we say that we need to be part of this larger community? Sure. Um, we're kind of running low on time, but I would like to know any last thoughts you all have and where people can find you on the internet. Where can they join your communities? Robin. Um, my last thought is create the community that you want to be in the world. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think like, Every person is a vital part of, like, a community is not a passive thing for anyone involved. So, you, um, if you're looking for community, it's, it's a lot of work on both sides. Like, you're looking for people that, um, share the values that you have and are interested in the interests that you have, but you also need to give as much as you're getting, and that's the only way it's going to work. So, 
Um, my last thought on the subject is like, please make sure that you're putting in the work and that you're sticking around and, um, or not stick, don't stick around to something that's toxic, but that you're, you're making all of those things known. Even if you are in a, if, even if you're in a community and you have to leave it for your own well-being, like do that, but make sure that they know, <laughs> um, where things have gone wrong. Uh, I'm Robin underscore Ravenclaw on Twitter. I'm Robin Ravenclaw everywhere in some, there might be an underscore, there might be a period. Um, but if you search for Robin Ravenclaw and you see a black girl, that's me. Um, <laughs> and if you're watching this and you're probably already a part of our community, um, or at least you're, you're aware of us, um, but go to blackgirlscreate.org. Um, and you can find us there. Um, follow at We Black and Nerds on Twitter, Black Girls Create everywhere else. Um, and hit me up if you want an invitation to our Slack community, but that's not the only place our community lives. Um, it's the wild west of our community, but it is. Um, um, but, you know, engage however you want. And and then you're, you're one of us. <laughs> Jesse? Um... I would like an invitation to my Slack channel. You, it's um, already there. Hold on. Like, let me shoot. Do um, it right now. We're going to do it right now. Right, I'm doing it right. I'm doing it live. <laughs> As we should have been. Should have um, been. Should have been done. That's on us. <laughs> A community goes both ways, though. So I'm glad you asked. The <laughs> uh, Daily Profit is wherever you can listen to podcasts. Um, we are on. Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at The Gaily Prophet because shockingly, no one has taken that before we, we snagged it. That's Can crazy. we also just say props to the name? Fire name. Just, <laughs> just. Thank before you. Before we even knew y'all and we saw that, we were like, did y'all see this? this <laughs> yeah, our resident comic artist came up with that pun and we're like, perfect. This is the, the clearly the best pun you could be using for something like this. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, we're thegallyprofit.com. You can listen to our podcast there and look at our merch and our comics and all that cool stuff. Um, if you wanted to learn more about me, I guess, uh, I'm on Twitter at jesse uh, underscore Detroit. Great. Portia. You can find the Harry Potter Alliance um, on Twitter and Insta um, at, at the HP Alliance. Um, they're doing a really cool thing with Eliana, who just was on. She, Eliana has this really cool series called Hermione Granger and Quarter Life Crisis. The Hermione Granger from that series is also with Hermione Granger and Harry Potter Lance's newest campaign um, to get Hermione uh, Granger president um, elected in 2020. You know, she uh, naturalized into a U.S. citizen and then, you know, it's fine. She's it's fine. Magic. She's a <laughs> we good. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So she's, uh, there's, the whole campaign, and it's really just to get people more like um, active and engagement for this election cycle, and doing what, what we need to do to get rid of Cheetah Voldemort, as he is known. Um, and um, so there's there's so many ways to interact with the Harry Potter Alliance, but that's a good way to kind of see what they're go what they're doing, what they're advertising before maybe you want to engage with them. They do have a good amount of like volunteer positions that are open, and they don't usually ask for a lot of hours. Um, so um, you look at if you go to their socials, you'll see their website information. Click on it, check it out, see what you do, what you do as you will. Um, and I'm uh, Portia underscore Avi on Twitter. Also, check out the um, Granger Leadership Academy because it's cool. It's Fun. coming up, coming up in the fall. And yeah. you, I tried to talk it up a little bit here, but it really is a really great place. Um, you would enjoy the activism there. And I think this year with the theme of being uh, Granger, Granger's campaign is gonna be like the like one of the coolest ideas to rally around that I've heard of in a long time. Amazing. Um, you can find me in the Black Girls Create community uh, and on Twitter and most places at Constar24. Uh, we've got another panel coming up, so please, please, please stick around. Uh, but we'll be taking a quick break and then uh, the last panel of the day. Thank you to everyone who's joined us for two panels so far.
Hello. Can you see me? Am I good? Yes. Yeah. Oh, hi. <laughs> Everyone is unmuted. Delia, this is your show. <laughs> All right. Well, hello, everybody. Hello. Um, so we're here, the last panel of the day of our first digital convention. So that's exciting. Um, I'm assuming if you're watching, you already know, but I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Delia Gallegos with Black Girls Create. I'm the marketing director. The title uh, was a work in progress for a while, so sometimes I forget. Um, and yeah, so we're going to be talking about critical fandom and how to critique the things you love. Um, a lot of y'all have probably been watching all the other panels, but I think it'd be good for us to just go around real quick, give our pronouns, our names, and our houses for those who maybe weren't there earlier, like me. So uh, again, my name is Delia. I'm a Ravenclaw, she, her pronouns, and we can just go around starting with Portia. Oh, um, I'm <laughs> Portia, Portia Harris. I am she, her pronouns, and I am a Ravenclaw. Slytherin tendencies. I'm a Slytherin slash Ravenclaw man. <laughs> okay, Nicole. Well, I mean, we can see your names, but still, say it. <laughs> I'm Nicole. Surprise. Um, I'm a Gryffindor, like, extremely. I've never, ever, ever gotten a secondary house at all. She, like, never. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Gryffindor, Gryffindor. <laughs> um, and I forgot what the rest of the question was. Pronouns. Pronouns. Pronoun. Pronoun. Um, she or they. Cool. Go ahead, Mars. Um, so I'm Mars um, at Mars in Charge. I actually was not allowed to read Harry Potter when I was little. Um, but the test on Pottermore that I took told me I'm a Gryffindor. Uh-oh. We I got two in, a, two in a panel. <laughs> uh, I'm a Gryffindor with, a, my friend told me to say this, Phoenix Feather Core Wand. I don't know if that's special. Mm, I think it's okay. But yeah. And then she, her are my pronouns. <laughs> cool. And Robin. We know, but go ahead. I'm Robin. <laughs> she, her pronouns. I'm a Ravenclaw. Ooh. I don't want to hear anything else about it. <laughs> um... <laughs> I'm a Luna Lovegood, Xenophilius Lovegood Ravenclaw. Okay. And um, yeah, that's it. That's it. All righty. Well, so today I'm actually pretty excited to be doing this panel because we've done versions like the Black Girls Crate brand has done versions of this panel at other conventions, but never in an all black space. <laughs> so, um, just going to start um, with how long we've been nerds, give or take, and what do you remember being your first fandom? Whoever wants to take it, go for it. Um, so I'll, I'll start off. Um, I've been a nerd, and I put that in quotes because there are a lot of things I just thought I was just the only person who liked it. So I'm like, yeah, this is my little thing. Um, for a very long time, but I would say... Like I was like a really, a really small child when I first started kind of watching things that people didn't really know about. Um, but the first thing I did that was nerdy that I really think of as a nerdy thing was I skipped school to go see um, a Lord of the Ring, which was like I was like in high school. But it was just me and like a bunch of old white men. And so that was just my <laughs> first thing when I was like, this is not normal for, for me. Like this is not a. This is not a common experience, I don't think, for like a 15, 16 year old black girl to be like, I'm in the movie theater, it's a school day. I'm like, I'm gonna see Lord of the Rings. They did not have intermission. So I was like, not. Nah. I was just, that was like the first thing I really remember being like, this is, <laughs> this is, ab this is not abnormal, but it's just like, this is a nerd thing that other people like me, like other kids, other girls, especially other black girls, are not probably doing at this moment. <laughs> so yeah, that was my, my first big thing. Hmm. Yeah, I relate to like not knowing when you started being a nerd because it's like <laughs> I remember being little and like as young as four years old and loving Sailor Moon. So like, you know, it's kind of just always been that thing. My first fandom, like, it made me think about like what I call fandom because, you know, I love anime um, for my whole life. And then I don't think I was connected to like minded group, like like minded group of people until I was vice president of the anime club in high school. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> in the college, yes, as extracurriculars. Um, but I think, like, if I were to define fandom as we know it, modern, like in the modern sense, I guess 
Super Who Lock <laughs> okay. on Doctor Who and Supernatural, especially, and then like concurrently, like the MCU were my first one. Yeah. What a time! Um, if I'm thinking about my first fandoms. I guess like Disney was my first fandom because like mm-hmm. wet kids. Oh, that's true. Up. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> all the Disney thing. Like I had all the Disney apparel you're right, stuff. You're I right. had, like Lion King sleeping bag that I used to take out in my backyard all the time. It got it got like a little messy over time, but I loved it. It was my thing. Um, so like like Disney was like my my first fandom. Like I think of a fandom where I like had my mom and dad like I have to have the next VHS tape. Like where is it? Like, my collection. <laughs> three together, which are different animations will not just appear by itself, you know, and you know, bring those tapes out, learning all the songs, belting out all the songs, all the Disney life, all of that. The problematicness of me loving Pocahontas, because she was like the first like brown who was this these white men are dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it was love. It's great when you're a kid, but as an adult, like literally, it you is, have it every is as an adult. Just, just leave it in nostalgia, please. I re- I rewatched it as an adult, and I was like, I wow. I don't have I don't have any like I don't have any need to like try to reinvent like what Pocahontas is. I know it's like I know it's not great, but as a kid, it was like she was the only like brown like person like who was like part of like the major universe. It was so cool, and she had like. Miko and Grandmother Wheelow, and I was like, this is like really cool. And yeah, over time, and, you know, was Jackson, and then we got Mulan, and things got a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Tiana later, but again, yeah, so Disney definitely, and then all the major things that come with being a Disney kid, and then become like, and you know, the critique of growing of that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I've been saying, I feel like I've been talking about NSYNC a lot this today. You but sure have, but please, <laughs> it's cool. go ahead. I, well, I was going to say, I've been saying that NSYNC was my first fandom, but that is so wrong because it's Disney. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a crazy obsession with my autograph book. Um, my dad used to take me, so I, I grew up in Anaheim. And we Back when um, season passes were an affordable thing that you could do with your family. <laughs> Ripped to these poor children in Southern California. Um, but my dad used to take me... Um, before bed to Disneyland to watch Captain EO. Um, we would go in, watch Captain EO, and then we'd go home. <laughs> and then like every, you know, on the weekends and stuff, we would actually go to Disneyland. But like, I would like, there were like probably like two to three times a week, we would just go watch Captain EO and the fireworks. And then I'd have to go to bed. Um, but I was, I was, so I was obsessed with Disney, with the movies, the entire thing. But then I was also like, super obsessed with Disneyland um, and getting my autographs and <laughs> bringing it full circle back to NSYNC. I once chased, I didn't chase JC, I actually quibble with this. So I saw him <laughs> and my brother yelled at him to go. He was like, run. And then I ran because I, yeah, so it was, it was rude. But I like the Mouseketeers. Wait, your um, brother told JC to run. I just want to be I mean, clear. I don't think JC even heard him. Like, it was literally one of those things where they, the NNC did like a, they did a performance and then like, you know, they go backstage, but there's that like little second where you, they're going backstage, you know, away mm-hmm. from people like me and my brother, <laughs> I heard my brother say, run. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> um, but I digress. Uh, but yeah, like, every, like, the movies, Disney Channel, the the mm-hmm. park, um, it just all of it was a world in which I wanted to submerge myself in. Well, Connie points out in the in the the chat that um, InSync was your first fandom through Disney, so that's kind of wild. That's not true, actually, because the MMC had they had a group. Not the party. So there was the party from the new MMC, but then there was a second group with JC uh, and Tony Luca and Del Gopoldo and Rona Bennett, who is now in um in Vogue. Just so y'all know, Rona, she out here. She's legit. Um, that was my first, like, yeah. Okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it is hard to define because now that I'm thinking about Disney, I'm like, but was it my first random? Like, I watch a Disney, but I wasn't, I don't know. It's because it, it's, hard especially kind of like 
you know, Mars was saying in our like modern concept of fandom, like what is, what was my first fandom? Because I just kind of grew up in a nerdy family. So Mm -hmm. we just, it was normal that we all played video games, that we all did that sort of stuff. Um, And I think that's probably pretty common because I think fandom, whatever it is, looks different now. Oh, (laughs) sorry. I was just, because I did not grow up in a nerdy I mean, my family, my house was nerdy in a sports context. Got it. Yeah. That, yeah. And I think also fandoms broadened to, to include just things that you're passionate about. I think used to, it was like specifically extremely nerdy things like video games. Whereas now it's just anything you can find a community and be passionate about yeah. around it. Mm-hmm. Um, so with that said, what are your main fandoms now or main fandom if it's the one? Um, even if it's not Harry Potter, or if it is, you can just re- restate your your mission statement, I guess. Um, we'll start with Nicole, because her <laughs> at is right there. Oh, I did it again, <laughs> huh? Um, um, yeah, I, I mean, Doctor Who uh, is one of my, I think it's probably currently my biggest, I don't know, it's hard to say biggest, because I love everything, and then I'm always very, like, somehow equally invested in, like, five things. Which mm-hmm. is, you guys have experienced in the Slack. Like I'll be watching Doctor Who and then I'm like watching another show and I'm like writing theories about Doctor Who, like right there in the Slack. But I'm also like, I can't believe this is happening, like Sweden about the show I'm watching. Y'all are like, how are you? What are you actually watching? Which is like, <laughs> I'm not watching Doctor Who now, but I thought about this. Um, so it's definitely one of my top fandoms. And I obviously love like the MCU, which is so broad that it's kind of hard to say, oh, you know what I mean? Because I'm not necessarily into the comics as much. Like, I try, but I don't have the attention span for comics, really. Um, so I love the movies, but I'm like, I don't know. It's weird. But yeah, I saw Doctor Who, um, the MCU, Star Wars, but like, and I'm like, I always thought I was really high up there, but I'm like, no, I'm like a baby Star Wars fan. Like, compared to like, <laughs> like Mel, for example, she's like, you need to watch this and this order and this. I'm like, okay, let me write that down. Let me get, oh, okay. And, you know, so it's, I kind of actually like enjoyed the fact that I just realized I'm not as big of a fan as I thought I was. Because it's like more stuff to discover in the fandom that, that I'm in. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Go for it, Mars. I see you thinking. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'd like to think of fandoms as like exes, right? And I oh, interesting. <laughs> fandoms right now. I think the MCU is what I scream about the most on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, Tommy can confirm. Like, I am constantly screaming like, specifically. Oh, talk about how I could have wrote this better. <laughs> um, and I'm like wearing an MCU shirt right now. It's the limited edition, like the fight of our lives, like. Endgame shirt. Anyway. Um, But I found that I had to abandon a lot of spaces that I love just because Mm. the anti-blackness was so much. And like it it, I was like, I can't, especially after Black Panther, I was like, y'all are doing the most with Wakanda right now. Like I remember reading a thicklet on Tumblr that was like Darcy's in Wakanda. And I'm like, well, <laughs> why is Darcy in Wakanda? And why is Natasha queen of Wakanda? What's going on? Like what in the colonizer? I don't understand. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna pump the brakes on y'all. Like, let's All right. Go. Wow. <laughs> Right, I was like, let's take a break. We need to, we need to, take, we need to take the pad apart. <laughs> I was like, let's see other people. I'm gonna go watch some anime. I'll be back in a couple of years. Um, I love you. Like, it's all love. Um, so, like, I guess it's like a weird in between space, you know? Yeah. Who knows? Portia, Robin, do you want to say something other than Harry Potter? I will say currently Star Trek. Um, I, I find myself thinking a lot about Star Trek. And I also think because of the shittiness that is our current political and social every day, um, Star Trek, when I watch it, I am always annoyed by the white liberalism that is Gene Roddenberry's <laughs> vision. They'll just, they just be like, oh, y'all still got poverty? Who does that? We overcame <laughs> racism and hunger and yet all of our captains look like, but the, until, I mean, the <laughs> we have a black captain, but it's not really shit, but okay, well, whatever. Um, but at the same time, there is like this level of diversity and this like baseline. I was thinking, cause I was um, thinking about like 
toxic fandom in general. And there are, without fail, times in which people on the internet will talk about Star Trek and like the new Star Trek, especially being like for social justice warriors and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And like without fail, the first or second comment is someone being like, have you watched the show? Like, do you even know? Like the whole premise is social justice warrior. The whole premise is diversity will out and like, you know, first interracial kiss on TV and you know, all of the stuff that they did. So I think about it a lot. I'm not as active as maybe I should be or want to be. Um, and that's like the Doctor Who issue of like, it's been on for so long and I feel like I'm still a baby Chucky. Because mm -hmm. um, even though I basically have been watching it nonstop since I started to fully watch it, I have not been watching it since 1960, whatever. And so, or since, you know, I would, contrary to popular belief, I wasn't born in the 60s. Um, you are 108. I, I am 108. <laughs> I might be 109 <laughs> soon now, but you I am cool. old. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I was not actually a, a being. My parents mm -hmm. weren't even alive when Star Trek started. So, um, yeah, I kind of digress, but that's my current obsession. Portia? So my longest standing fandom, which current, present, current, uh, carries on till today, is like Pokemon. A, I'm kind of what someone said earlier. Like Eliana said, libraries, like oh. books, libraries. <laughs> fandom. What, did you, what did you say? Pokemon. Oh, Pokemon is. It was pretty high. Pokemon. Okay, we, we play Pokemon, Pokemon together. I literally oh, I know. came in from like doing community like community day for Pokemon. <laughs> Oh, you actually go outside. That's so when my friend they be like, "Girl, it's once a month. Can you please?" And I'm like, "Okay, y'all got it." Look, I joined a Pokemon. Like, so Darren and I, um, we were all like, we were at the house and we were in Pokemon Go. I just, I mean, it probably been out for like a year or so. And there was this like, I think it was like, it had to have been like uh, Charizard or something. One of those like, one of those kind of rare find dragons. And it popped, it spawned in our neighborhood somewhere, but it was a couple of blocks off. So we just started walking out trying to find it. And we went up with a whole bunch of other group of like, just like we randomly were in a street, we're like, you, you guys want to? And they were like, yeah. And then we're like, okay. And then we we're just all chatting. And they're like, you know, there's like a bed side Pokemon group, right? And I was like, what? So we have a, we're part of this <laughs> Facebook bed side Pokemon group or whatever. And I get the notifications every all the time, but I, I never go out with them anymore. Like I never go out. Like there's the one time I met them was the one time I ever interact with them. I've never been sure. They are I can I can keep going on that, but it's really funny because they will go hop in a car and they will like be like, oh get this Pokemon. It's hilarious how community works um on these things that are like little randoms. But Pokemon is is a thing for me. And um the thing I was going to say was yeah so the books thing or whatever and so i'm still really really into books i'm always into like finding new more magical or whatever interesting books um and then uh game of thrones and the song of ice and fire series is a really big thing for me for a while like ironically i got into it because of the show because the show was so great the first season and I, I saw i the whole first season after it ended after i kept hearing about it and then I was like, well, now I have to read the book. So then I read the books. As, like, I think the four of them were out at the time. Um, and then I read the fifth book when it came out. And now I'm hoping that's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> We need it, precious. Hilariously, I started reading. I, I mean, the show was a reason why I got into Game of Thrones. And I knew the show was coming. But I started reading the books before the show. And then the, sh the first season did so well. I stopped reading the books. I was like, on, I was on the third one, and I was like, Nah, I, they got it. And it moves <laughs> faster. And if I have to read twenty pages about this dinner party again, I'm gonna shoot someone. And now the show's ended. I have no interest in going back, even though I know that the books are better. The show just ruined Game of Thrones for me. The books are amazing. I'll read the books, like, and then I was like, I don't even want to put my heart in this anymore because. I was first, I'm like, I'm a, the show's gonna end, and I'm gonna go back and read all the books. And now I'm like, I'm not even about to. I'm gonna wait till it's all out. Somebody can tell me if it's worth reading a billion pages. <laughs> if they're ever out. all I'm out, you're like, about to get played twice. No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like 
I feel like I was so passionate about Game of Thrones that I even like I was I joined it like a Game of Thrones podcast on the For All Nerds Network or whatever. Mm-hmm. Castle Black talks about Game of Thrones. We were all into it, and you can hear our. It's kind of like how like Robin and Bayana are. On music. <laughs> you can hear a gradual decline. Yes. Yeah. Goes on. We're just like, like yes, yeah, so we're here. Oh, I guess we're gonna talk about this again. Oh. Okay, here we are. Right. Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a whole, a whole panel. Um, I, I, the books are great. Go read the books if you want, but that's, you, that, that's all I can recommend in good, good faith. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess the next thing I'd want to know is how long you've been part of your fandom of choice and what about it made you join? I'll jump in uh, since I have my little, at Black Tardis. Um, <laughs> so for Doctor Who, I'll talk about Doctor Who mainly because that's what I'm most active in in the moment. Um, I It was Tumblr. Tumblr mm-hmm. was very, you know, like, the, I mean, they still, it's a lot of gifs is what I'm going to say. You can, y'all can you can have a discussion about that another day. All right. There were a lot of gif sets. And, um, and it was oddly Martha, like a lot of Martha gifs. I don't know, maybe I just only follow people who had like that kind of energy, you know what I mean? Um, so it's a lot of Martha Gips. I'm like, what is this show? This looks so cute. I'm gonna watch it. And then like, I'm like, okay, let me watch the show. And I get into it and I don't know who Echo Finn is, by the way. Like, I don't know the ninth doctor. I don't know who Rose. I'm like, what are these? Who are these people? <laughs> this is a different show. I don't think this is the same show that I was looking at. <laughs> Cause obviously I didn't know at the time about I was just, I didn't Google it. I was like, I'm gonna watch it. It's on Netflix. So I got into it, watched the whole show. At the time it was up to like maybe season six. Six. So I watched like everything that was available on Netflix. And so I was like, well, it's time to, you know, do the thing and go like on the Tumblr click hole or whatever. And I'm just going through and reading everything and finding everything. And I'm like, okay, Martha is my girl. She's that one. I love her. Like everybody must love her, especially because that's who I saw all the gifs of. And lo and behold, plot twist, they don't like Martha. I'm like, who's making the gifs at? Because the actual text posts are a little, you know, a little not as fun. <laughs> so for me, it was like I got into the show, and I like that's who I like connect with. Like Martha and Donna actually were who I connected with the most, and um, oh. like well, people love Donna, of course, but like you know, um, but Martha, it was just a lot of hate. So I was kind of like, let me, you know, kind of keep my little my introduction into the fandom to myself because I don't want these people in my mentions or whatever the situation was. And so for me, it was mainly just like my little bubble of like, this is my show. I love this show. Like I would tweet, like, I think I had a couple of friends who watched it. So I was like in her DMs, like, okay, I'm at this point. And they're like, why can't we, you know, but it was kind of just a private thing. Um, and I, but I wanted to engage with fandom, but I was just, it was, it was not, it was not as welcoming. I don't, I wouldn't say it was like deliberately closed off, but they did. I don't think the people in the fandom realized how, um, unapproachable it seemed like to a new fan like you feel like you had to have a so it was just a lot so for me it was more like I just kind of made my own little space and then people found me like I made Black Tardis I had another it was called it was called Critical Whovian because I just wanted to go off um about <laughs> the Moffat era is where, where it started at and so that's where a lot of people found me and that was just me talking mess, which I said in all my little info, like, this is not a fun, this is not good. If you like the show, you don't want to hear <laughs> criticism, just don't read it, because I'm not being nice here. The tags say this is hate or whatever, you know. Um, but a lot of people found me, a lot of people, like, agree with me, and that's why I found kind of the people who saw the same things I saw in terms of a critical perspective, like, just, like, how women were treated, um, you know, how Martha was treated, even Mickey, and, like, so... Once those people found me, I realized like there are people who like the show and also have the same kind of issues I have with the show and also look at it from a similar lens. And it's not just the people who love Rose and hate Martha. And it's not just the people who love Donna and, you know, just ignore everything else. So it was just mainly being talking mess and then people being like, I, I agree with your mess. And I'm like, oh, hey, mm-hmm. we can all talk mess together. You know, let's let's do it. <laughs> and I kind of literally what it came from, which is people who wanted to also be critical and not feel like they're by themselves and like feeling a certain way about the show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I've loved Marvel comics ever since I was like small, like superheroes are a thing. I, there was a, apparently a month period where I only answered to the name Storm. Um, oh, I, like, <laughs> I love it. I don't know who Marissa is. 
So <laughs> um, the name of my birth certificate says Storm. Um, <laughs> but then of course the MCU had a really explosive entry into the world of media, right? Like Iron Man came and like Iron Man is such an interesting hero to have hinged the entire thing on. And I was mm -hmm. 13, 14, the years escaped me when it happened. And like, I didn't know who Robert Downey Jr. was. Like what 13 year old black girl from like with Caribbean parents knows who Robert Downey Jr. is, don't know. Um, so like, yeah, and like getting to grow up with the MCU has been one of like the greatest pleasures as a fan. Um, I'm like, wow, like I remember being, you know, 15, 16 when this came out and being like, I can't wait for like the end of it all. And like now I'm an adult who witnessed the end of it all. And I'm like, wow, what's next? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's definitely like 10, 11 years if I'm counting just the MCU, which is crazy. I'm like, wow, I pay taxes now and I'm still paying to watch these movies. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, I gotta buy my own tickets now. I used to be able to be like, mommy, daddy, take me to go see Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's wild, an entire decade. Mm. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. I first got into Game of Thrones, like I mentioned before. Um, mm -hmm. It's completely random. Speaking of nerdy families, Darren's family is pretty nerdy. My family's kind of like, some of my family members are nerdy, like on my like my immediate family, but like Darren's whole family is just like they're a bunch of nerds. And it's Darren really cool. is her husband. Yeah. Is our, our <laughs> second husband, for those who don't know. <laughs> yes. Um, and his uncle happened to come over one day um and was like, Have y'all watched Game of Thrones? And we were like, What? I was like, I saw I'd seen the commercials, it was like another white medieval esque period thing. Like, do I want to watch that? Um it might be good. And he's like, no, it's like really good. And I was like, okay, fine, or whatever. Whenever the next weekend I have where I'm not doing anything, I'll just turn it on. Turn that heifer on. As soon as Brain got pushed out the window, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't watched the first episode of Game of Thrones. Um, as soon as Brain pushed out the window, I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> I just all the way through the first um, season uh, with Darren. And I like it caught me, and I was like, I, I have to read the books, and that's what I did. Um, and it was the, it was such it was so well done and such like so well written. I really do admire um, George R. R. Martin's like grasp of like world building and like building out like these really fully fleshed out characters. And there's some really cool characters that I wish that he they would have introduced in the show, but that would have taken actual writing ability, I guess. That's um, why they left them out, but, Portia. <laughs> that's what pissed me off so much. There's so many <laughs> dragons and subplots and. actual TV universe. Um, so yeah, all those things frustrate me about the actual stories themselves and what we're told um, out of the series. But um, having been to like Game of Thrones and seeing like listening to other fans and their other fan properties about Game of Thrones, I know there's a lot of really cool fan stuff that actually just delve into the stuff in the books um, and just, like explore what the issues that were going on with the show as well. Mm -hmm. Robin. So does it have to be about Star Trek? No. Uh, <laughs> so be I, I don't care. I was introduced to Star Trek when I was a baby. Um, and my mom's best friend is my aunt. And she's a big Trekkie, but she's really in a Deep Space Nine. And so it was always on. And she had a crush on Worf. And I thought that that was so weird because he's a Klingon. <laughs> but like, I get it now. But like when I was a kid, I just thought that that was really weird. And we had this relationship of like, she liked the thing, so I didn't like the thing. Like that was just kind of like how, I mean, to this day, I'm a grown, full, full grown adult, but she'll say something and I'm like, mm -mm, I don't want you. <laughs> so she would be watching me or I'd be spending the weekend with my aunt and she would just be watching Star Trek. And I come from a family of very much not nerds, so much so that even, even now when I recount like stories from my childhood and people are like, good Lord, you were a nerd. I didn't know that for a very long time. I thought I was a jock. I was a jock. I was, <laughs> I was playing basketball and going to church or to cheer camp. Um, and like, and so it was very much a thing in which I could like make fun of my aunt for being a nerd about. Um, and then it wasn't until they were all on Netflix and I had nothing to do 
And I, I had come home from a holiday or something and she was talking about it. Um, and I like asked people on Twitter, Amani, uh, on our community and some other uh, people that I knew about it, like if I should just start watching it. And then I just started watching and I haven't stopped watching. <laughs> and it's been probably like three years of me only really watching Star Trek. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I do, wa- I mean, I, I watched all of The Good Place. Great British Bake Off. <laughs> Great British Bake Off. Yes, I'm <laughs> caught up on that. Um, and Love like Island. Star Trek. Love Island. <laughs> Unfortunately, we'll talk about that, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about that. Keep that to yourself. <laughs> but yeah, so that's kind of how it, it was very, it was very gradual and then all at once, like falling in love, you know? All right. John okay, Marie. Bella. <laughs> Okay, so well, Nicole kind of got into this, but what, so I know we talk about this a lot, at least, you know, with Wizard Team and like Harry Potter specifically, but in general, I think for, I think it's common for black kids specifically, but definitely introverts um, that we like experience fandom very internally. Like we watch shows by ourselves, like beyond my family for a long time, I didn't, I mean, I had, a, I grew up with an early family, but I still wasn't like, you know, out there while in with the with the with the kids at like midnight premieres and stuff like that. Um, so what about not only these properties but these fandoms drew you out into fandom to like engaging with fan whether it's fandom works or actual people, the internet or whatever it was for you. Um for this I have to go to Harry Potter because it just has a right happen with that for me for Star Trek, though I would love to do a Star Trek podcast, guys. Um, she anyway. really keeps pushing us all to watch it. I'm like, girl, I don't know. I do. <laughs> I mean, but also I'm not pushing you that hard because I'm not going to watch Lord of the Rings, so it's cool. Um, yeah. It For me, it was my... Um, we've told the story on the Wizard Team podcast before, but Bayana came to visit and my mom was like, you need to hang out with your cousin. And I was like, she's a child. And I am not. And what the hell are we going to do um, for a week? Because she like came for spring break or something. Mm-hmm. And she packed all her Harry Potter books. And I was like, oh, you like Harry Potter? And she was like, yeah. And so we read a Harry Potter book. And then we watched the movie. And then we read a book. And we watched the movie. And my mom was so disgusted. She thought that I had like turned Bayana into me. Um, that one of my go-to childhood punishments was I used to get kicked out of the house. Like, I, like not kicked out of the house, like seriously, but like when other people would get grounded, I would get sent outside. Like my mom would be like, get out. Like, don't come back for two hours. Go talk to someone, go like experience sunshine. And I'd be like, but why? And then I'd sit in the front yard, wait for my dad to come home and let me back in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but so Bionic came, we were reading Harry Potter, watching Harry Potter to the point that my mom brought back. She reinstituted kicking us out of the house. Dying. To which we, <laughs> I drove her to Target and we bought the last Harry Potter book and we went somewhere else and sat down and read Harry Potter. <laughs> um, and so it really just came from like having those conversations with her um, and then being aware of other Harry Potter podcasts and trying to listen to them and not getting... Um, not getting what I wanted from them and getting those things from the conversations I had with Bayana and then being, you know, I'm a film major and always been really into like production and storytelling. And um, it seemed like a good way of which I could like do that without, you know, like an easy entry into like doing that. So um, yeah, that's how it happened. I guess Tumblr, which like at this point, I'm basically a Tumblr like brand ambassador. That's where I built the majority of my platform. <laughs> like I've been on Tumblr for more than 10 years. Um, mm-hmm. I guess, yeah, so Tumblr was it because I, like along with the MCU, like really like the fandom on there exploding around the Avengers, specifically like 
Loki fangirls taking control of everything. Like that was a moment, that was an era. Um, <laughs> I also was like, unlike when I was in high school and like in the anime club and that was really like, I was vice president, but I was surrounded by guys and guys who like anime and mm. that was, it was not, a place I felt safe. No, Make as sense. somebody who has also liked um, anime since high school, it's not a it's not a place safe place for it. at all. Like and yeah. like my authority was basically like my position. Like despite being as passionate and as like really interested in going to MomoCon because I was living in Atlanta, like going to MomoCon every year and like doing that. Like my role essentially became like she's the girl, so she's there to be like pretty and like mm -hmm. fan service us in real life which was like a whole nother panel to like unpack all that judged yeah i like tumblr was really just like oh wow i can while out about how attractive i think the guys from supernatural are like with other girls who are kind of quirky and strange and like get all my white boy thirst out in private y'all like hey <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that was so yeah tumblr was definitely like oh gosh i can like find other people who are also making media that i like to consume right like the gift mm -hmm. sets the gift sets were popping like you can tell fandom gift set tumblr anything like they were like this is how you edit remember that scene like we cut it up and it's great and it's cute you can like have your own little dragon horde pile on your blog of just all your nerd shit just like kind of just sitting there and you can scroll your own blog and be like wow i have taste yep. um, <laughs> so yeah, i was definitely like woo let's get it tumblr is that that place for me and i don't think i've i've found a place irl yet like ever that i've been like yeah this is a fandom right. place i feel really comfortable in although i will say like understanding that more and more black nerds have built such amazing spaces both digitally and like IRL, like going to, um, I think like two, three years ago, I went to like a black girl nerds like event in real life. And that was my first time being like, oh my God, everyone here is first of all, looks like me, what a win. Like, this is so cool. And we can just be comfortable and nerdy. That was it. So I will rescind, like I have found like one or two, but it's like finding a mirage in the desert. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which is hard. I think Tumblr is actually, I would say, it facilitated a lot of people's entry into fandom. Because even for me, I watch Supernatural since it premiered, like, weekly. Every week. Wow. By myself. Wow, you are every OG week. Supernatural. So I, but I, I mean, was the only one. I thought, I'm like, who is, how am I just on every season? I'm the only person that watches this. So clearly, <laughs> the news inbox is not counting me as a million people because I'm the only one who ever has watched this show in my life. Um <laughs> Like, I literally felt that way. And, like, I would tell friends, you want to watch it? Like, I don't like scary stuff, or I don't like this, or, you know, they're white boys, whatever. I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, <laughs> but that's the fun of it. Like, it's stuff that you really feel like. And so um, when I got on Tumblr, I mean, like, I had been on Tumblr for a while, but I think it was, like, a point where, for me, Tumblr was kind of a music kind of thing. I had way more, like, bands I followed. And and I don't know when it became, like a like, a, pop culture fandom thing where it was more like shows and stuff like that but when it happened it was a lot of supernatural and I'm like oh there they go <laughs> 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 like, that's just who's keeping this show on the air because I know I, I mean like I feel like I feel like I'm doing a lot for them but I can't be doing this much and then I think I had like some Nicole friends was carrying the fandom on her back oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had like friends and like oh yeah I went to the supernatural convention I'm like the, the, the what the who the what now the what the what <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I met Jensen. And I'm like, first of all, that's just rude. Like, that nobody told me about this. Because I never thought to Google it. Because, again, I'm the only one that's watching the show. Like, how are they going to have a convention with one person? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so it was just totally had me. Like, I was like, wow. It's like, it's literally a lot of people that watch the show. And then surprisingly, a surprising number of those were women of color and like people of color. Because I'm thinking, like, I'm definitely the only black girl watching the show. Like, you know, we don't play with the devil. Um, but <laughs> no, it was like a lot. We all like okay, it's, okay, hey, hey, girl, hey, girl, hey. Like so, I think mean, with supernatural, especially then, like of course, like she said, super hula. Now, I like all those shows, but I don't. I did not like that thing. <laughs> I was like, I hate y'all. Why are y'all like this? Let me just post my little thing. They always made it into a super hula, even if I'm just talking about hoop, or if I'm just talking about lot, or if I'm just talking about supernatural. It somehow became super hula. Like, I'm like, I ain't talking about them right now. Okay, I'm talking about hoop. So, it was just, but it was fun though. Like I really, but I think that was. 
like again, it kind of found me. Like I'm just minding my business, talking about what I'm watching. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, it's a little stupid little show I watch, but I've been watching for like five years, and nobody ever watched it. And then people are like, oh, supernatural, and they got, and they know so much about. It. I'm like, I've been watching it since the beginning. I've literally never heard of whatever you're talking about. And it's like they pick up on things, and then I guess people that came into it from like Netflix, they can watch it all in one big chunk. So they like pick up on things that I didn't pick up. I was watching it on TV, and like I had to catch it. At eight o'clock, uh, you know, y'all wasn't super common like they existed, but everybody had TiVo. That was that premium. We didn't have that TiVo. You got to get TV. You know, because I was just like weird to me. I felt very much like I'm the only one watching the show, and nobody watches this. And you get on Tumblr, or you get on the internet, and you're just like minding your business, and then you just happen to click through, and you find like it's a whole community of people already surrounding the thing that you never even thought to look for this community because you think. This is no, there is no community for this. And that happened with me for pretty much every fan of my men. It's not even that, like, I was like, let me find this. It's like, I'm just minding my business, typing up something, you know, just, and then there's somebody to reblog it and it turns into a thing. You're like, what is, what is, I don't get, what? And that's, I mean, honestly, Tumblr, I would say Tumblr should get so much credit for like, for perpetuating fandom and culture because it literally, every single fan of my men, I think I got into the actual, like, the big part of you know what I mean, like the community part of fandom through Tumblr as a as a jumping off point. That's cool. I think that's probably true. Like even though I don't, I fundamentally still don't really understand how Tumblr works. I find it hilarious <laughs> just to like kind of scroll through it. Mm-hmm. Like I have tried to have my friend who is more into Tumblr. I've tried to have her explain the tags to me numerous times because they don't work. <laughs> it don't make sense. No, people own. don't use them. For what they're for, which they're is their like own categorization. <laughs> they make they put whole posts. They put tag. whole posts in the tag. I'm like, hey. I'm so confused. But it, um, it is also <laughs> as someone who I guess I should, uh, as someone who watches a lot of British TV, I end up mm-hmm. going online a lot just because, like, one geo blocking is stupid. So I need to know when the actual thing is coming out, and then I need to find it <laughs> by any means necessary. Um, <laughs> And um, to like, I would say like a lot of my favorite comedians and stuff are actually British comedians that are not, they haven't really crossed over. They're like only like, like Sean Locke and John Richardson are hilarious, but they're like, Americans don't know who that is or who they are. Um, But like Tumblr does. (laughs) And so I think that, yeah, I think that's true to call like, even just as someone who doesn't, post really right. i do a lot of re- maybe a lot of reblogging but i don't really post much mm. um just scrolling through super who lock was also annoying to me um but that was a <laughs> Ooh, that was a moffat thing it was, and i didn't realize it was a moffat thing until afterwards because mm. i like a lot a large part of the reason why sherlock i turned off of sherlock and i almost turned off of the doctor who at the same time was because he was doing the most but the absolute utmost. Um, um, I don't watch Doctor Who anymore. See, and I could I stop watching Sherlock. I was just like, can't okay. even fault you for it. Like it, <laughs> it's it, it was a time to get through. <laughs> yeah, it was rough. Yeah. Um. So, oh well, you didn't say Portia how you got pulled in. Well, I guess is that your story about Wizard Team is that is that how you got pulled into fandom? <laughs> Basically, yeah. And then because of that, um, I went and explored fandom for Game of Thrones and there I am. <laughs> and here we are. Um, so in becoming part of fandom and we've, we've talked around it already um, a bunch, but you know, we come into these spaces and they're broadly, it's changing, but especially at the, I think at the time we're all coming into these spaces, they're broadly straight, cis, white, male spaces. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, times change and these works aren't always, you know, unproblematic. So um, at what point did you start looking at it with a more critical lens, whatever your fandom is? Um, Have you always looked at it that way? And have you ever been just completely turned off by fandom content, fandom or the content itself? Um, So with Doctor Who, just people, I'm like, it was very off-putting. Um, to see kind of the fandom reaction to things that I enjoyed in in the show. And I felt like people weren't critical of the things I was critical of because I'm looking at it through my like black American 
female, you know, lens. And so I just really didn't want to be in the fandom. I'm like, oh, they doing something different over there. I don't know what that is. Um, but I also, at the same time, really wanted to share my love for the show and really wanted to talk about it. I'm like, I need to, like, I like force my friend to watch it. Like, oh, you spend a night? Okay, let's, oh, let's put on this random show. <laughs> and then, you know, we're watching the whole show. Um, so it's stuff like that. Like, I kind of made my friends become a part of the fandom, you know, my our mm-hmm. little fandom. So I have someone to talk to um, about it. And then I just felt like, well, I'm sure there were some of us. And I, of course, some of, like, again, they found me. Let's just, you know, let, like, it's not going to be a big thing because, like, maybe 10 of us watching it. You know, <laughs> like, it's not a lot of us. Um, but let's mm-hmm. just make our own little whatever, our own little community. So that's initially what Black Tardis started as. It was kind of a community thing. And it was on Tumblr. And like I wanted people to post, you know, send in their stuff. And But also, I have no attention fans. So I was not checking the Tumblr. I wasn't doing what you're supposed to do on Tumblr. I was just reblogging stuff and then closing the app. But um, so I didn't like, fo- like, you know, I didn't really sit there and like foster it and like keep it going. Um, so then when I brought it back, I'm like, you know, this is going to be me. And then hopefully, again, people find something in it that they like and that they agree with or that they want to talk about, engage with. And then that's what it ended up being. And it was kind of just wanting to talk about it. And like, it doesn't have to be a fandom thing. I'm just going to talk about the show and whether or not people want to engage with that. That's up to them. Um, and I think that was kind of the similar for every every fandom I'm in. It's more so like, I just want to talk about this and, and other people who want to talk about while commune around or both wanting to like share this and talk about it and break it down and pick it apart. You know, I think it was just somebody else had to see it this way, right? Like somebody else had to see Martha or somebody else had mm-hmm. to see like how they're treating this character or that character. And once it's you know that you're not the only like, person, yeah, right. like it, that's when it's kind of community forms about us just having a shared experience or a shared kind of perspective about things. And it's just it grows from just everybody naturally wanting to talk about it from their own personal experience. Hmm. I think I've almost like, um, like been critical. I've always been, I've always been like, wait, hold on, let me get my thoughts. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> I think I've always been like critiquing the like MCU because I love the comics, mm-hmm. but like mm-hmm. I didn't come at it from like an actual place of cultural criticism until maybe I was 17, 18, like getting to college, like reading more, like becoming more of a human and like really understanding like, yeah, fandom can be kind of hostile. Like Mm -hmm. I knew in the back of my head that similar to anime that like it was a boys club or like Mm -hmm. I didn't have the language to really understand that oh, comics are whole, like largely thought of as a white male space. And like you being not that, like it's, you're gonna be challenged, you're gonna be questioned. Like people are gonna wanna know, do you really know those comics the way you do? Like blah, 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 mm-hmm. like what's your favorite? Um, and that's when I was like, you know what? I'm gonna start being a little militant. I'm gonna be spicy. Nope. <laughs> <I'll look laughs> yeah. And so like even she said she's done. I was like, I'm finished. Like friendship ended with niceness. Like critique right. is my best friend now. Like I am right. ready. Um, especially as like my platform on Tumblr grew and I got to be like Tumblr famous. Mm-hmm. I was like, Yeah, y'all gonna get the smoke. Like, let's talk about <laughs> <laughs> I was like, let's talk about how like that plot line in Avengers was right. really able. Let's talk about how that one-liner I can tell like that one-liner from that one movie that he said like it might not be a big deal to you but it tells me a little bit of the pop like about the politics of the person who wrote it like mm-hmm. being that and like you know it's like you know no fun allowed I'm like yeah I'm the fun please like mm-hmm. I can tell you that the fact that for years the fact that I had to choose between a black male character and a white woman mm-hmm. as like the requisite, like you have to put two and two together. Like, do I have to like merge Rhodey with Black Widow to feel like I am seen? Like, All right. mm, that's not for me um, until Black Panther. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but it took so long and that was kind of my hill to die on with the MCU fandom for a very long time to the point where people were like, you're just bitter, huh? And I'm like, 
Sure. I am. Sure like, I am. A little bit. <laughs> sure am. Because I didn't even get to see a storm that looked like me on screen because they made her night skin. Like, here I am, bitter.com. Like, <laughs> uh, I've been watching a lot of Frax and Family. She's like, that's actually my Tumblr username, <laughs> bitter.com. Bitter.com. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, it's it's been at least five years of me being like, yeah, I'll go get this and I'll, like, whatever. Right. It's fine. Yeah. You too, Portia, Robin. Um, well, I will say that I um, I went to school for media studies. And so um, in high school, when I still thought that I wasn't a nerd, um, <laughs> one of the first like media criticism classes I took was called Film as Literature. Um, and so we would watch films and... Um, studied them in the same way that we would, you know, you would take an English class and like you would have a syllabus of books to read. Um, we would do that, but with films. And then I was in like really heavily involved in like um, film production in, in high school and then moved on to that in college. And that was like my major was screenwriter, um, screenwriting major and media studies. And so I've always really dived deep um, I've always wanted to be involved in production and television. I was in high school and my mom took me, uh, my mom knew someone that was a producer on Will and Grace, which was my favorite show at the time, and took me to like see a taping and then go behind the scenes and like look at all the like different aspects of what it takes to create a show. And um, I was spoiled, guys. I was like, you know, living, living a good life. <laughs> um, but I... So I can't really remember maybe past like my Disney Channel days, like after that, like not really looking at things from a critical lens. And it wasn't always um, like a cultural criticism. Like a lot of times it was just like, why would they set that shot up this way? Or mm -hmm. why are they, you know, who's the cinematographer here? Like what are the choices that they're making? And being just like super nerdy in the production side of things. Um, and then getting into college and stuff and then bringing more of that cultural criticism in, um, recognizing more, it sounds weird, but like not really interrogating what it means to be black um, until I got to college. And then I was in Indiana surrounded by not just white folk, but like KKK folk, <laughs> like, you know, like just being in a place in which like, you know, I'm taking a class and like in the, in like the lecture hall is a mural about the history of Indiana and like the formation of the KKK is like sitting right next to me as I'm like learning um, and being like, okay, you know, all of those things, like all of that, like watching, you know, Birth of a Nation in high school and like knowing the bullshit that that movie was, but then watching it again in college because you do, if you're a film studies major, if you're thinking about becoming a film studies major, you're gonna watch that movie <laughs> a few times. <laughs> um, it is important to the history of film, uh, sure. but it's also fucking violent as hell. Yeah, so it's literally <laughs> like KKK propaganda, but all right. Yes, but like in terms of like the history of film, it, yeah. there's a reason why you study that film. Anyway, um, but yeah, but being older and then like actually seeing that like, Oh, okay. This movie, yeah, it is. It's propaganda for this ideology, but like all of these seeds of like these are the starts of these tropes that show up in Buffy, that show up in Harry Potter, that show up in all these like different mm. things that you that I love that I thought was so far removed from that. You know what I mean? It's like that moment when you realize like history is is still happening in the present. And um, you went somewhere else than I thought. I thought you were about to be like history. <laughs> And anyways, <laughs> but you know, like history is repeating itself. And so I think that like, I have, so from, from very early on, basically, um, I've always come at things from a critical standpoint. Um, and, and learning more now to kind of just enjoy things. Star Wars, I think is the first like fandom property in which I was just like flashes and bangs. Yay. And like, um, and, and also, like, very consciously, like, not even diving into fandom and not diving into what people are saying about the movie with flashes and bangs, because I don't care. Like, it just, 
you know, lightsabers. Um, so yeah, I think that that's been just kind of embedded in me and in like how I've consumed media for as long as I can remember. So when, when you're in these fandom spaces and you're being critical, obviously I think the theme is, and we know it's a theme just by experience, like people aren't always receptive. Um, how do you maintain a love or enjoyment of that fandom or work? Sometimes it's not, you can't even maintain the love of fandom, but at least the work um, while still remaining critical. Go oh, Portia. Well, if you're like me, you latch onto the one black character that you ride with <laughs> in the show, beside, you know, the one gray worm, but Masande, you know, you latch on to Masande. And when she rides through Winterfell, for looking at her like she is like the scum of the world. Um, you're just like, you know what, Masande, I know that feeling. I know, I know that life. Although I don't know why they didn't give you braids out here in this winter climate if you're okay. hair out and washing <laughs> down. <laughs> a weird, like, wow. Right. Um, mm, interesting. <laughs> but uh yeah, you know, when that like that thing's like like when my Sunday died, I was like, well, at least she went out on spoiler like Jakar <laughs> until death. Like Jakar's here, Jakar's there, Jakar's to everyone. Just, you know, I like that she went out true to, I guess, who she was, but and it really, like, not really, because why was she captive? Why wouldn't she have, like, told, um, freaking, you know, I, I just, I feel like, you know, a lot. There, but <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that I have, uh, like, some mirth and, like, joy for is that despite, um, the Game of Thrones fandom being a very white fandom, um, and being full of a lot of, like, dudes. Um, like universally, like nobody likes how it ended, and mm. they may not have the same critiques that I do for why I don't like how it ended, but they definitely like it's just like poorly received among most people. So that was one of the like one of the observations that I saw recently that kind of like made me laugh was that um, like for Game of Thrones to have been such a phenomenon while it was airing and have such massive like live tweet discussions and so many different communities like popping on it and for it to just be like a whisper tumbleweed in the wind yeah. and anything about it now because it's like traumatized everyone um it just like shows the measure of how like the community is like of like game of thrones fans who are just like you know what i'm not even gonna honor this story like and with further discussions i really don't know where to go from here like we just don't know even know what to do with it mm -hmm. and I hope that sticks with the legacy of, of um, the producers as far as they go. Like the legacy of like, you had this thing, you built this thing, you could have capitalized on this thing and look at what you did. And we're never going to like ever trust you in the way that we used to ever again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so funny to me how quickly they squander that goodwill. Like. <laughs> Just yeah, like you said, like tumbleweed in the first show that like would dominate the internet like For, every week while yeah. it was on, and the next day while people were talking about it, like yeah, yeah, it fizzled out. Mm -hmm. Like it almost feels like it didn't happen. Like it, where, it where really we, does. Where we like in it like that? Because I remember fever <laughs> having mm -hmm. to like box. I like, mute every single keyword, like every yeah. name, any nicknames, anything, just so I could not be spoiled in the three hours till it airs in my time zone. <laughs> and then, like two days later, I'm like, uh, nothing. And I'm like, I unmuted everything. It's just nobody talking about this. Nobody has nothing to say. We say what we have to say, and we're done with it. It's in the yeah. past. And I think that like, is hilarious, actually. And I'm like thinking, like about Amani's like comment in the chat. Like he's like, I'll start to make a Game of Thrones reference now, and then just stop. It mm -hmm. literally used to be the cultural thing, but like, yeah, she talked to that girl just like Lady Elena did to freaking Jamie. Tell Cersei it was me. Like all the memes, all the like fun like jokes you could have with people, all the water cooler conversations you have with the coworkers after work, like during work, it's gone. Yeah. yeah. Gone. Like, 
there's nothing you can there's and like you think of things that like have stuck with us like you i thought game of thrones was gonna be like a like parks and rec or whatever like years after the thing has been done or whatever you're still mm-hmm. making waffle jokes or whatever mm-hmm. out of nowhere but no because no one wants to be part it's kind of like a sour brand now it's like yeah. you want to be with this like like sour milk like ew yeah, yeah. And, and the ending of the ending of it really spoiled everything else mm-hmm. I do think and I think about this a lot with like fandom online mm-hmm. and oh, I'm just gonna out myself it's fine it's over my life is over I am like super deep into the UK Love Island oh uh, <laughs> like, the same like, thing. I hate myself for it, but do I? Because I just introduced two of my best friends to it last night. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I'm out here. But there's like a there's been an ongoing problem in that on that show about the treatment of black women, especially, but um, the the people of color and the dark skinned black people, and like it's a British show, so like all of that baggage, but also just like mm-hmm. as we've talked about, like just the black women and like desirability and putting them in these situations in which there are these ridiculously conventionally attractive black women, skinny, fit, six packs, whatever. Um, But then putting everyone else in that same environment is not fundamentally attracted to black women and carries a lot of that baggage with them and what that does to the women. You know what I mean? Like, um, and it's weird, but the show has a large, like, social component to it. And you see a lot more people talking about that, like, calling the producers out, like, why would you put this woman in here and then only put in men whose types are blonde hair and blue eyes? Like, that right. is violent to those women. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, someone who is objectively desirable. <laughs> like, these are, like, right. not... Like, they would be on the cover of, like, any magazine, like, right. that, you know what I mean? But the, the problem with them is that they're dark-skinned Black women surrounded by people who are not attracted to, for a myriad of reasons, who are not attracted to dark-skinned Black women. Um, and being called out on that. And, like, seeing in, like, this most recent, ep- I mean, it's not changed enough, but seeing, like, some of the changes oh, that are being well, spoilers. made. Spoilers. But you know what I mean? Like, see, Don't do see, it. I'm not doing it, but like seeing seeing those conversations come to the forefront. Um, and I think that like that cultural criticism is a big part of that. Um, be, one, because as someone who's a viewer um, and also living life, you walk around and you're like, oh, so we're just not attractive. <laughs> like, or we're just not right. desirable, yeah. right? Yeah. You put yourself in this and you're like, well, we're not desirable. But then pe- because you have people speaking out about it and speaking out about it publicly, then you're like, oh, no, 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 no. It's not us. It's like the environment that we're being put in. It's the stories that are being told about us. It's the lack of stories being told about us. It's like the tropes that are made in which Black women are only seen in these lights because that's the only way that they're allowed on television or in media. Um, And I think that like one thing that we've seen a lot too is like even with Game of Thrones, like it's a white... it is a white show (laughs) Mm. aggressively. So, um, but like the online discourse, like hashtag dim thrones and like a lot of like, you know, Migos doing (laughs) songs about game of thrones and you know what I mean? But like the cultural capital that blackness has and like Mm. being able to really own that, um, it has helped even in my fandom journey of feeling like, you know, like I can speak on whatever I have feelings about. I can like, and not only do I have standing to speak on it, but like, I am sure that there are people out there who believe the same as me or have thought, but maybe don't agree with me, but have at least thought about it. Mm -hmm. Um, And without speaking up about it and without calling these things out, like we're never even going to get to have the conversation that leads to some change. Like we're not there yet, but like, um, like we're seeing certain steps being <laughs> made. We're, we're, we're inching in the right direction for the most part, I would think. Um, we're short on time. So um, 
I just want to end on one question, the last question. And if you want to roll up your answer from the last question into this as well, you can. Um, but just wanting to know what advice you have for folks who want to engage more critically with fandom. Like maybe they're just sitting at home watching and they also feel like, you know, I, am I the only one that notices it's weird that Hermione tries to start, you know, this elvish welfare situation, but nobody takes her seriously. What does that mean? Anybody? No. <laughs> Um, so do you have advice for folks who want to engage more critically but are hesitant to do so maybe because they see how other people in the fandom react or they just don't know where to start? I my like the way that I kind of maneuver through everything is like I realize that it's sometimes really not worth doing harm on behalf of a fictional thing. And like mm -hmm. of course doing harm is a really broad thing, but like, it's not worth being ableist. It's not worth being classist. It's not mm -hmm. worth being racist toward each other in defense of this intangible world. You might feel, and it's hard because you feel really, it feels really important and it feels like you are seen and represented. And so when you, when you get defensive about it, it's like, it's tempting to do that, but you could also just block people <laughs> or you could also just scroll past things that upset you. Mm -hmm. and keep your peace of mind like prioritize your peace of mind is my best advice like maybe you want to toss that little like why is Hermione trying to do this like onto your blog if it gets heat it's going to get heat because people are going to do that you can delete the post or you can block people like always do whatever you need to for your own peace of mind mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially as a, a person who was like like marginalized in certain ways like it is not worth your sanity mm -hmm. period Especially on a place that's followed like Tumblr, like Tumblr kind of. <laughs> I got I got called slurs over Steven Universe and Hamilton, y'all. Like mm -hmm. Hamilton. That's a whole. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Anyways, uh, <laughs> um, for me, and I think this is more of a recent lesson or a thing I figured out is to have a so there's like a personal circle of people that you can be critical with, who mm -hmm. y'all can really go ham, and it's like. It's not a judgment. It's like now that now is that some is that some bullshit or not? It's just me. Or was that racist? Am I reading too much into this? Because there are things that you think and you're like, maybe mm -hmm. I'm really honestly taking this too far. So instead of putting that on Twitter, you know, say hey, hey y'all, hey fam, is it just me? And y'all have those conversations. So then when you if you feel like you want to take it to Twitter, and I I mean I do this, like I'll say I'm very spicy on Twitter. I actually don't care, but I do still have, believe it or not, there is a process. <laughs> like if it's something real spicy, I'll be like, hmm. Y'all, it ain't just me, right? Like, I have a little support here. Like, I'm not, because I don't want to be talking out, you know what I mean? Like, just saying. So, I think having a circle of people that you can kind of run things by or, like, process with first, because if you put it out on social media first, all the responses you get are going to be, like, that's going to be the only thing, the voice you're hearing, you're just going to see. You're going to be like, wow, this is what they're thinking? Okay. Whereas if you have, like, you've already kind of run it through a certain group of people or your friends or whatever, they're going to be able to be, like, you kind of already have the perspectives, the different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And then so you are prepared for whatever the response is. So there might be something where I might, like I just put up a poll, like randomly, like a fun poll about like ships in the show. I'm not really invested in the answer so much as wanting to see what kind of things people think because that's not something I care about actually. And like I'm not that critical of it other than I like, I want there to be some queer relationships, but that's just because they are queer baiting. I feel like, well, um, <laughs> but what I really like, I would ask my friends, and I kind of know the answers to what we would all say in our personal, like our little Slack. But I also kind of want to see what other people will say. But nothing's going to surprise me because I'm like, I've already kind of processed this and I already went through the motions and I know all the really the answers that might come at me or, you know, most of them. So it's like, if somebody says something that's like out of left field, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I think having like a, just a buffer point between you and social media before it gets to like, don't like don't let the first thought you have be the thing you care about your mentions. Because I don't care about my mentions sometimes. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'm not gonna say that because I really don't want to you know, offend these people. And especially because I do have a lot of white followers. Everybody day to day. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I mean generally, I think that actually applies to literally every single thing, but especially when you're talking about fandoms and things that people are super passionate and connected to and they have like feelings about. Because there are a lot of things like I say jokingly about Star Wars. Like I talk about like the Raylo. I actually don't care about the ship as a ship. It's more of the behavior around the relation, you know, between those characters. I don't care about the ship. Y'all can ship whoever y'all want to ship. You can ship any people you want to ship. I do not care. They ain't got nothing to do with me. 
than what I'm thinking. But the problem is like the behavior. But knowing how they are, it's like if I say something about Raylo, regardless of how jokey I'm being, I already know like this might be a thing. So I have to decide, is this important enough to deal with the fallout? And like at two in the morning, I'm like, whatever, I'm gonna do it. What are they gonna do? Tweet me? Like, you know what I mean? Like, but you have to be prepared for like, <laughs> like I do wake up sometimes to Nicole's tweets. I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> no, it's like, so I'm just like uh, whatever. I'm not getting no sleep. I just drank my coffee. I'm definitely out here. It's whatever. But it's like things that are important and I think are too nuanced to have a Twitter conversation about. I definitely already have people that I can we can go in and have a real breakdown. Like that's mm-hmm. one thing I'll say I like about like the black girls create community is that like for every show, like we're in the Game of Thrones room, we're talking about the show, we're talking about the books, we're in the Doctor Who, you know what I mean? We're talking about Doctor Who, we talking about everything, and it's like we all are being funny and joking and having these kind of conversations about like representation and is this is this queer baiting? Is that racist? Is that is that offensive? Is that ableist? I don't know. I want to say is ableist? I don't know because it's not my community, right? We're having those conversations in a kind of closed space. So and when we all space, people will call each other out too, if if we are like coming from left. Say something. You're like, yeah. ooh, oh no, run that back, run that back, please. Um, <laughs> don't say it out loud. Now we ain't gonna do that because we're your friends, but you will get beat up in the street. You know, like so yeah. you just have to have that kind of a buffer, and that's for anything. But I think especially when you're talking about things that people have a certain kind of connection to and a passion about, because even though you don't mean it personally. They take it personally. I learned that the hard way with, like I said, I started that blog critical who being. To me, I was just talking about I'm just, doo, 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 doo. but people really like love Clara. And I just talking about Clara. I really was. I'm not gonna lie to you. I was like, I hate this little girl. She got my damn nerve. But so many people saw themselves in her that they took that as me. Dashing them. It took me a while to realize like that they're internalizing it as like, well, these things we have in common and you dislike them in Clara. So then that means you dislike me. But I'm like, no, because you're a person. That's a character. Somebody made deliberate choices to make this character this way. You just happen to be who you are. I can't judge you for that, but I can judge the writer for being like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make this girl, boo, 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 boo. you know what I mean? I'm gonna make this girl wear sweaters and short, like short skirt, because that makes sense. Like, are you hot? Are you cold? What do you want to do? Like, pick a struggle. I don't know what's going on. Like stuff like that. But that's a choice someone makes, so I can I'll criticize that. But just, it's not me criticizing that in real life, even though I do also question it when I'm seeing like weird. Like, what are what are we doing? Is it warm? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um so yeah it's just having a buffer having somebody you can run things by and that can be one or two people it could be a large group of people it can be but as long as it's not the first thought is like i'm going straight to twitter right this is gonna yeah. be a tweet like you should not do that or you like the drafts my drafts are they they're ugly i'm gonna tell you, i'm gonna be honest with you I my mean, drafts are ugly i've had <laughs> I've definitely deleted some tweets back before I had a community to like, and then I've gone back and been like, let's delete. Yeah, and I still to this day, I'll like just randomly look at, like, we'll be talking about something. I'm like, let me check this keyword real quick. And I'll be like, ooh, you don't have no friends. You don't have not one friend. So you're like, and I'll just delete it. It could be from like four years ago. I'm like, I don't matter. I don't want to find that. I don't want Disney to come and get my check, even though I'm working them yet. But if I do, they're not about to kick me off of nothing. They're <laughs> clean. they gone. You know what I mean? So I think just like having people to like run things through first, being prepared to like whatever you say, you have to be prepared to ignore it or fight back. And like I'm too lazy sometimes to fight back. So I'm like, yeah. I'm I want to ignore jump it. off on what Nicole was saying though about like be- people being human. I think you can critique characters, you can critique choices that creators made Mm -hmm. um but you also have to know who's making who you know who made the choices right and know Mm -hmm. who you're critiquing and also Mm -hmm. sometimes like if you don't like something that finn did in star wars don't at john boyega he didn't like that he's doing his job and also like you can say john boyega but you put that at that goes to him like he's gonna see that exactly does he need to (laughs) you know what i mean and he gonna come for you i I, I bring this He's right. But like, I've been, think, I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm like going back through, I, this happens to me on cycles. I'm going through a, a instinct tailspin right now. JC Chazé does not actually need my thirst in his mentions. Like I could just say JC. I don't yeah. have to at that man. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> like, I mean, if we, you did, he'd just be like, oh, that's my boo. I know her. That's, that's but, my boo. Right. <laughs> We've been going together. We've been going together yeah. since I was in the MMC. But like, but you do, you, you start to, um, 
I think everyone does this, but mm -hmm. some people more than others, you start to like really identify with celebrities or creators or like actors. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you confuse them for who they're playing. Um, mm -hmm. A thing I will always love Samuel L. Jackson for, cause he's just like, yo, I don't know what y'all like, or Harrison Ford too. Like, I don't know what y'all talking about. Like there's right. some words on a paper, I read them and then I get a check. And like that. Yeah, they're like, we're actors. That's what yeah, I do. Exactly. That's what I do. But that's I know what you think I know something about this yeah. means I did a good job. <laughs> right. Samuel Jackson's like, I mean, I like Marvel, but do I know what Nick Fury did in the eighth issue of Incredible Hulk 196? Like, no, I don't. And I don't <laughs> care to know. Like, that right. wasn't what was on the paper. So stop adding these people. <laughs> yeah. It costs um, Nick tagging for a reason. Yeah. And I just think that, like, Always keeping in mind, and this is for everyone, like even if you're going at it, like or you're you're having a conversation or a discussion or an argument with like a fan, just keeping in mind that there's humanity at the end of that. And you don't know what mm -hmm. like you don't know what those people are going through that day, that second, that moment. You don't know how your words are going to hit someone. And you might think, like, oh, I'm just giving like tough love. Nobody needs your love to be tough. Like, <laughs> you know, the world is right. tough. Like life, right. the universe is tough. Can't your love be soft? Like, just let it be that way. Like, I think that, like, you can have conversations, you can call people out, but you have to also understand and know, especially if you do not know the person intimately in real life, like, you don't know where they're coming from. Don't get, like, uh, insert Tessa Thompson gift. Don't get familiar. Like, yeah. over familiarity on the internet is a problem. Is a, is a problem. And I mm -hmm. think that, like, we can critique you. And, uh, these stories that we love and we love them and that's the reason why we have critiques for them. There are aspects of the stories that we can critique. We can critique choices that are made. We can critique the way the story goes. That does not mean that you need to attack the person. Exactly. It doesn't like someone could write something that's crazy ableist. That doesn't mean that they are out here trying to like push an agenda. Maybe they just have a blind spot mm -hmm. or maybe they have the wrong thinking and you could like, you know, help, point out to them why that thinking is wrong. They Someone could write something that is like anti a lot of different things, but that doesn't mean that they are like literally sitting in their like lair, rubbing their hands, being like, how am I going to commit genocide today or something? You know what I mean? Like it's just, you know, we have people out here trying to actually do that in the real world to real people. And so let's keep those things in perspective as we give, and, and still give your critiques. Cause I think people mm -hmm. can learn this is all, and I think it's always also about learning and improving and constant improvement. Um, give those things, like tell, like share your thoughts and your feelings and your opinions, but just remember the human, human on the other side and like humanity on both, goes both ways. Mm -hmm. Any last thoughts on that Portia before we wrap it up? Yeah, um, particularly like if it, if you're someone who you're doing, you're engaging in this all these ways, you're thinking deeply through it, you're running it by people and you're like thinking through how it is you're critiquing. I think that if you're struggling with just having an outlet like to place these thoughts, especially if it's about like a fandom or something that came up to you like recently, I know of a certain little website that has a critical <laughs> component series where you can write your little, your essay like critiquing. If you're black. Is if, if you're, you're black, if you're not black, you can still write and we'll find somewhere to post it. So it just won't be here. If you're black <laughs> and you have a very deep conviction about something and you are you're good at critiquing it, there are some editors who are standing by now on the bottom of the house. <laughs> 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 Like we, there's so many different ways to critique and understand stories and we're all like receptive to really good critique and understanding because sometimes there's things we just don't know about or we haven't considered and that may be um you know there's obvious things to us like why nagini being a an asian woman but having an indian name <laughs> is wrong and then all of that and there's also like we there's like blind spots of like oh like why are all the dark creatures entering the battle on the side dark creatures entering the battle of hogwarts on the side of the dark side or whatever like what does that mean right all these different things so we there is a whole website that does help people get those critiques out and then secondly for that same website um i do think <laughs> like from my own experience i just want to share that like i critique books 
Um, I write reviews for this uh, for Black Girls Create, and I personally choose to not write bad critiques uh, for books that I don't like because it's like there's enough negative crap out there anyways I can like indicate that how I feel about a book like I'm good reads with my star level I don't have to go out of my way and write about something being bad unless I feel like it's like hurtful right um, just but that's just less energy for me to have to put in the world I have a bajillion other things to do anyways I don't need time to just sit here and write something about something that I really like hated I'd rather spend my time writing about something I really like so sometimes take that into perspective like do you really want to put extra energy that you could be using to do something else to do something kind of new. Mm -hmm. And I have one more addition. All right. And I think people don't realize that there are a lot of tools out there for you to do things that you don't have to wait for somebody to give you permission to do it. Tumblr is free. Yeah. WordPress.com is free. There are numerous under other blog platforms. You know, Facebook is free, but it's Facebook. But you can make your own space on the Internet without having to wait to be invited into mm -hmm. a community. I started my Tumblr. Several people here started their own blogs, their own communities. And it wasn't I wasn't allowed to do it. I just did it. And then it became whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to wait. You don't have to be invited into somebody's community to participate. You can just start doing the thing. I would say start blogging, start whatever you want to do. You write reviews, start on Goodreads and cross post them onto a blog. That's a blog right there. You're blogging. You're already doing the work. So just remember that if you want to do something and you don't know how to do it, almost certainly there's a free tool to let you do it. And you just literally mm -hmm. say, how do I start a blog? You'll get so many things that give you ways to do it. How do I start a podcast? There are so many things that so many free resources for you. So you don't have to be the best at it. You don't have to put money into it. You could just put as long as you put the time and the energy mm -hmm. and the passion into it. You're going you're gonna to create something. And that's one thing that I think people don't necessarily realize. Like, oh, I love your community. They started that community the same way most people start anything, which is like, I'm going to just give me a little domain name. I'm going to get a little hosting and we're going to do it like we're going to do it. And it's really just making a choice to do it. That's it. And, you know, there's also when we'll end on this and then we'll go around and shout yourselves out. Um, but, you know, also being critical, we're talking, I think for some people, it might be kind of daunting to be a critical fan because it's like, right. well, I don't know how to say it or put it into words, but you can also be critical through your art. Like there, you can, they're fan art, fan fiction, like write yourself into the world. We have a project on Black Girls Create called Hogwarts BSU, but with any fandom, you can be critical in that way. It doesn't have to be an essay necessarily, or where right. you sit down on like this panel and say what your issues are. Just right. go out and create for free or not. And then maybe get paid one day. Who knows? Like yeah, the world is rolling or like do all of it. Let's like all of it. Shoot. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks you guys. Um, let's go around and say where we can find you, what you got going on. Um, we'll start with Mars and work our way around. Um, nothing much happening. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, search for me, Mars in charge on all platforms. I think there's an underscore at the end of my URL on Instagram, but like if you search Mars in charge, like you'll see my face. Um, I am actually... Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but hashtag blackout day is a hashtag that happened five years ago. We're trying to bring the renaissance, it's renaissance time, baby. We got to bring it back. Um, so that's going to be on March 6th. Uh, there's going to be details on that on my Twitter. Mars and Challenge. All right. Yeah. Go ahead, Nicole. Um, you can find me everywhere because I have no attention span. Um, so at Black Tardis on the socials. I think it's a dot on Instagram because nobody doesn't get their name on Instagram, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like, what are you doing? Um, and then, like, I I post, like, reviews um, for some shows on, like, Den of Geek. So if you want to read about shows like Charmed or... And then just, like, helping with the community at Black Girls Create and trying to, like, you know, just keep it popping. I'm I'm a little I'm all over the place, but you can just find me on Twitter, and I'll definitely I'll definitely like tell you where to find what you're actually looking for because I have a lot of little things going on. <laughs> Portia, I am Portia underscore Avdi on Twitter. I use I'm not very active on a lot of things. I can <laughs> use on Twitter. That's where you can find me. Robin. I'm Robin Ravenclaw on Robin underscore Ravenclaw on Twitter. Robin Ravenclaw most everywhere. If there's an underscore or a period, I don't know. But um, <laughs> I like Portia most active on Twitter. 
Um, and then you can also find me at blackgirlscreate.org. You can find me um, popping in and out of the community. Uh, I'm in the community less than I'd like to right now, but that's okay because Nicole um, she is there. It. It's, she got it. I'll be walking in like, what happened? <laughs> Six hours later, what, what, what down? Um, but yeah, I'm I'm just here um, hoping, waiting by my inbox for y'all to have some creations. Um, mm -hmm. very heavy with my, my hand on the gas emoji in the slack. <laughs> um, and Stop on Twitter. You can get this work on Twitter too. Right on mm -hmm. Twitter. You know what I mean? <laughs> like just, I'm just here hoping and waiting for you to create something that I can consume. So. Um, I'm at Delia Dumbledore, mainly on Twitter. Like I have other, but I'm not on there. I'm not going to lie to you. You can find me there and I'll get back to you in like two months. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, this was great. This concludes day one of our Kumba kickback. So we'll be back tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific time, which is 4 p.m. here. Is that right? Here. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be here. I'm hosting hey, Black and- I'm on a panel. What's up? Start talking though. What does that mean? You have a panel? What does that mean? What? Uh, Robin. Um, oop, you, I thought I muted muted. myself. Nope, you're not muted. <laughs> Anyways, tomorrow we'll be here <laughs> on Pacific for Eastern talking about Black and Potter casting. And we got other fun stuff. Check us out on Twitter at Black Girls Create. Right? Is that our Twitter? I don't no, know. is that We Black and yeah, Nerds? That's we Black and Nerds. Black Girls. Black Girls. Black Girls. Black Girls. Okay. I think we, we lost Robin. She dead. That's it. I'm, I'm not dead. The, my, the person that has my dog called, and you know, it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, my. If y'all know my dog, you know my dog. Like, you gotta answer and then be like, Can I call you right back? Or is my dog dead? You know? So, uh, yeah. She's fine. She's fine. She's fine. She's fine. <laughs> but you know, she just be out here chasing cows and stuff. So I never know. So, chasing what now? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. she, she be chasing cows. Anyways, y'all, we went anyway. way over. Thank you for joining <laughs> us for this panel. I, uh, I'm i going to predict right now that tomorrow's last panel will also go over. That's yes. my prediction. Um, Kumba <laughs> Kickback Day 2 will be back on um, I just YouTube. You can yep. go to our website, though, <laughs> and find the link. Sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, y'all. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. <laughs>